Ladies and gentlemen, can I uh, welcome members of the press and public to the second uh, meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2015. Uh, can I'd like to th ask all those present to ensure uh, that their mobile devices are either switched off or placed into flight mode uh, so that they don't affect the work of the committee. Uh, colleagues, can I uh, take us to agenda item number one? Uh, and firstly, that is the question that we take agenda item number three in private. Can we agree on that? Colleagues, can I now take you to section and agenda number number two, uh, which is evidence from our two panels this morning uh, in the Auditor General Report for Scotland's report entitled Community Planning, Turning Ambition into Action. The committee will first hear from individuals involved in the community planning partnerships. Uh, I'm delighted to firstly welcome uh, Councillor Jenny Lane of Aberdeen uh, City Council Leader. Uh, can I can also welcome Chief Superintendent Adrian Watson. Local Police Commander, Aberdeen City Division Police Scotland, uh, Susan Webb, uh, Interim Director of Public Health, NHS Grampian, uh, Councillor David Parker, Scottish Borders Lead Council Leader, uh, Alastair McKinnon, uh, Regional Director for, for South of Scotland, Scottish Enterprise, and finally, uh, John Rain, uh, Chair of NHS Borders. Uh, can I welcome our panel this morning? Uh, you're most welcome. Uh, can I uh, first of all uh, refer you to the report which we are uh, discussing this morning and can I take you to section, and I will ask the first question and this morning a number of my colleagues will uh, follow, uh, can I take you to section 24 uh, of the report uh, and the reference and the statement from the Auditor General report which she says that the community planning partnership boards are not yet fulfilling their role effectively. Uh, strategic oversight and, and challenge still tend to be happening at local levels. Below the CPP board, many boards are overseeing the community planning post process but are not showing uh, leadership. Pretty robust statement from uh, the Auditor General in that respect. And I wonder if any uh, members of the panel would care to, to respond to, to what we have as what is a robust statement. Who would like to come in first of all? Good way to could I? Perhaps uh, yeah, uh, give you a perspective from my position as a NHS chair in the borders. And, and I, I should preface my remarks by saying that I can only speak on behalf of borders. Um, I'm not familiar with uh, the way community planning partnerships uh, do their business across the rest of Scotland. Um, and I read the report and I've read the transcript of the discussion that uh, this committee had in early December. And uh, I must say, I, I mean, it was quite depressing reading, I thought, particularly the transcript. Um, and the overriding message that was being delivered was one of uh, failure to deliver. And that is not the experience in borders. Um, I think we do borders a disservice if we didn't draw your attention to uh, some of the progress that's been made. And I think what did help the borders is that we were a pilot uh, study for the Audit Commission uh, 18 months ago, uh, we, we volunteered to have our community planning partnership work uh, uh, reviewed and validated, and it was a bit of a mixed report. We were told that we were good in parts, there had been a long history of joint working, uh, but there were uh, a number of improvements that we needed to, uh, to make. Um, we needed to set a, an ambitious vision, we needed to identify priorities where community planning could make a difference. Uh, we needed to ensure that our partners on the strategic board and in the whole work of community planning actually did fully understand their roles and their responsibilities and clarify ways in which partnership decisions were then reflected in the formal governance arrangements of the partner bodies. So that was very good. It was salutary stuff. But what it did do is that it led to uh, a programme of improvement it was actually a quite a good wake-up call for the borders. And the response, as I perceive it from my position, has been a very proactive one. Um, the operational and the governance structure of the, uh, the partnership has been substantially developed. Uh, a fresh impetus has been brought to bear. Uh, we've got a board that functions well, in my view, a joint delivery team of chief officers and others, program groups for the key themes of economy and low carbon reducing inequalities and future services reform. We've agreed a vision, we've agreed an a, a approach to performance management, which is now being piloted. 
And uh, whereas I, I, I noted that Douglas Sinclair spoke about a fallow period when he addressed you uh, in terms of the, uh, the long waiting time really to see results from community planning. I do think in the borders that fallow period has come to an end. Uh, I wouldn't want to weary you today with uh, a range of initiatives and things that are going on in the borders, but we do have a lot of uh, projects, initiatives, uh, which are relevant for community planning, which contribute to the strategic objectives of community planning, and are projects which over time can be monitored in the sense of being able to determine whether they're actually delivering a benefit. So things are moving in the borders. Okay. Um, and, and David Parker, I'm sure, would, uh, as the chair of that uh, board, would want to uh, endorse that. Okay. Councillor Ling, from your perspective, in terms of your own uh, council, is it something you would like to specifically uh, respond to in terms of this, this section 24 of the report? Yeah, I mean, I think um, from our perspective, it, uh, part of it is fair comment, I have to say. We have had, uh, unlike borders, it seems that they've had quite a settled period. We've obviously had um, uh, uh, changes in personnel at levels from various partnerships, uh, both ourselves and the council with the chief executive. Uh, position, um, you know, changing, uh, the leadership of the council changing um, in the, the uh, middle of last year, and also with NHS, we've obviously had uh, chief officers from there and chairs of the board, and I think we need to reflect on that, and that has obviously had an impact, I would say, at our board level, but, um, you know, as I took over the chairmanship of the board uh, in the middle of last year, I would say that I, th I feel um, in that time we've been making progress progress around that. We're working hard within the board to identify the areas in which we need to be taking action and that's why recently we've um, decided to have a refresh of our um, single outcome agreement because we feel that it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it will not help us achieve the outcomes that we hope to. It's not outcome um, focused enough. Um, so we are doing a refresh of that at the moment um, with a, a rewrite planned along the lines of that. And I think because at the end of the day, it is about the delivery in the communities that we should be working towards. And we feel that that maybe hasn't been um, reflected in what's been going on. But having said that, we do have good partnership working and we have good examples, um, which hopefully we'll be able to reflect on today. Um, so I am um, you know, optimistic about um, moving forward. Um, and I think that we have a, a common um, goal within um, the Community Planning Partnership in Aberdeen um, to achieve better outcomes for our communities, and we'll be working towards that. Okay. So any other members of the panel want to come in on that specific point? Okay. Colin Beatty. Thank you, Mayor. I mean, as Mr. Ains touched on, the uh, reports that we've seen here uh, make fairly depressing reading. I mean, CPP has been around for 10 years and more, and the progress that's been made uh, just reading the Auditor General's reports is fairly minimal. And yet this is a, such a vital uh, exercise to get these CPPs working in order to have effective outcomes locally. And we've got the November 2014 report, and we've got also the March 2013 report. And as far as I can see, there's been fairly minimal progress, according to the, what the Order General is telling us. Now, one of the key areas that seem to be not working is the way that CPP partners are engaged and sharing resources, or more correctly, not sharing resources. And I'd be interested to hear from the panel what their experience on, on, on how effectively these resources are being shared whether it's actually practical that they will be shared. It needs a lot, the Auditor General trust, it touched on the word trust. Is that, does that trust exist among the partners to enable this to work effectively? Yeah. Uh, just to give that practical example, and Jenny touched on it as well, that we would try and cite a few uh, positive experiences. And, and I do take on board and respect what you're saying in terms of that strategic overview. It is a real challenging area for us all, and there's much more still to do. But if I can delve into the realms of community safety from, from an Aberdeen City perspective, that trust that you speak about, 
and that support across the partners in understanding what the priorities are for Aberdeen around safety is, is clearly demonstrated. An example I would give you around about a community safety hub where we've all supported financially and with resource up front to deal with the agreed priorities from the communities across the city through the Community Safety Partnership. And we now have a community safety hub, a living and breathing one, where there are staff from right across the partnership working on a daily basis, addressing the strategic priorities of community safety, working right back up to community planning and, and dealing with issues that really matter to folk in Aberdeen day in, day out. Now, that's taken on some evaluation from Scottish Government and other interested parties, and we seem to be heading in the right direction. And that's a commitment and a will from all partners represented around the community planning. And it's one, I think, certainly a pilot where we can build on, both locally and nationally, dare I say, and we're starting to see that tangible benefit. And the objective evaluation is certainly suggesting that crime rates are going down, but that's only one indicator. People are feeling that bit safer. Uh, and other positives uh, that I could certainly go into, but certainly that's one that I would cite as falling from community planning, because I needed that buy-in from our partners. And without the community planning vehicle in Aberdeen, I don't think we'd be where we are. Point. Yeah, I think, Kim, it's, it's certainly my view in terms of resource sharing. I think there's a, a good uh, examples of resource sharing. And I think it really depends what definition we're talking about. If we're talking about a pooled budget that the CPP controls, I, I think that's a little bit of a red herring. Actually, what we should be looking for is do the community planning partnerships lead to better partnership working? And are there positive examples of where we are sharing staffing resource and financial resource, albeit it may be that the individual organisations hold the budgets themselves because of issues around accountability and other issues. Now, in the borders, we have a joint community safety team which has staff and resources from all the different partner agencies in it. It was one of the first in Scotland and has done extremely well. We've got a joint um, dementia service. We have a joint mental health service. We have a joint adult with learning disability service. We have the borders guarantee where 100 places will be given uh, to young people and um, children coming out of care uh, to make sure that we can give apprenticeships or training examples. All the partners are contributing to that. And there's many examples of very good quality joint working. We've avoided some of the governance issues. I think one of the big issues with, with pooled budgets and issues of that is you get into debates around who is accountable for what and you get into arguments about which governance model do we set up to monitor the money. Actually, that's a red herring. What community partnerships should be doing is focusing on making sure that we are delivering jointly together and we're working in partnership and delivering services together and certainly in the Scottish Borders we're doing that and we can cite many examples of both you know, key services that we're delivering or very localised services that we're delivering in our region. I mean, we're talking about sharing services here and sharing resources, but there's more to it as far as the CPP is concerned. We're talking about shifting resources towards preventative activity. That's, the, that's one of the most significant and key areas. Is that happening effectively? I... Yes, I, I, I'm happy to, uh, to respond to that. Um, what we don't have, of course, is um, aligned budgets or integrated budgets as far as community partnerships are concerned. And as David said, I, I, that, that's probably a bit of a red herring because the community planning partnership is a voluntary enterprise. Uh, it does rely on leadership. Um, and that was touched upon in uh, the Audit Commission's evidence to you, that uh, leadership has gone wrong in certain parts of Scotland, and there was uh, a suggestion that in one particular area the leadership of, or the community planning partnership wasn't functioning well uh, because of the lack of leadership or the lack of uh, uh, relationship, good relationship between the local authority and health board. In terms of leadership, I think we've got that right in the borders. Um, I think, and that's reflected through the organisation, and that's been helped by the work that we've, we've had to do over the last 12 months or more to set up a, a shadow health and social care integration board moving towards the creation of the, the real board as from April, because that's brought together um, local authority and uh, NHS. It's led to a better understanding of the issues that we both face. Uh, it's led to a better understanding of the respective roles of non-executive members of health boards and local authority uh, elected members and the different accountabilities. I think there's that better understanding. But in terms of, I, I, I think community 
planning partnership will make progress very much on the basis of consensus and uh, leadership without necessarily having to uh, uh, identify and allocate uh, budgets to the partnership. I think uh, we need to know what the partners are spending uh, and how perhaps over time those expenditures can be aligned to specific strategic objectives uh, of the partnership. But I, I would find it very difficult because of the different accountabilities and governance of the partners, it would be extremely difficult to get into the position of having budgets uh, uh, that are integrated or you know, terribly closely aligned and any control by... I'm astonished to hear you say that because the whole thrust of CPPs is so that we can align exactly. key budgets. And I was a little alarmed when you were talking about membership being voluntary. And perhaps you can maybe expand on that a little. It's, uh, it, it, it's not the way that uh, I would read CPPs. Well, it's, the CPP is a, is a, is a non-statutory body. Uh, the partners participate, and under the Community Empowerment Bill, there would be a duty on partners to participate. Um, I'm not aware that there's a further duty to... Uh, 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 go down the route of uh, integrated budgets as there is... You regard the, the, the CPPs as voluntary to join or not join? Uh, oh, no. No, I think uh, we, we as, as partners uh, know that we, we need to be part of. But I think we, it, it's about being part of the partnership because you want to be. Um, I know we are aware that we, we need to be, but it's because we recognise that we have an important part to play as a health board uh, in the objectives of the community planning partnership. But, but Mr. Rent, a key part of the uh, CPP... Just, just finally, just in terms of, can we focus on the report and the contents of the report, and obviously we can elaborate on some of the points around that. Just one final question, please. A key part of the... CPPs is to align budgets. So we're all heading in the same direction. And you seem to be indicating that that's not possible. Maybe, maybe you could elaborate a little bit on that. I think it's possible for and practical for uh, the partners to uh, be transparent about their budgets. Uh, and when there's still the opportunity to make a difference to the allocation of uh, money within budgets, that ex exposure should be uh, there at the Community Planning Partnership, so influence can be brought to bear for budgets to be concentrated uh, on priority areas. But, I mean, just bear in mind that we live in, as we all know, uh, financially constrained times. Uh, local authorities, health boards, other partners have their own mainstream services to deliver. Uh, we have our heat targets, as you, you're familiar with, to... Uh, to uh, to deliver. Um, our concentration has got to be on uh, delivering uh, health improvement, efficiency, access to treatment and quality and safe treatment to, uh, to patients. That's not to say that there's conflict with uh, those targets and what the CPP is seeking to do because the first uh, of those targets under the heat uh, regime is health improvement. And that very much aligns to the work of the CPP. What we spend on health improvement measures uh, and on inequalities, addressing inequalities, is very much aligned to where we want to be as a community planning partnership. So, how do you see the... Uh... I'll, I'll bring you back in later on. Okay. Mary Scanlon. Thank you. And can I just say that uh, I was uh, on the committee along with several colleagues when we had the 10-year report... Uh, so, uh, given that the legislation was passed in community planning in 2003, we had an Auditor General report in 2013. Uh, that report was uh, very disappointing, and, Convener, I will be very brief, if I may. Uh, CPPs not able to show they'd had significant impact in delivering improved outcomes. Uh, CPP is not clear about the key priorities for improvement and, as a result, no consequences for not participating 
uh, fully. So naturally, as a member of this committee, and we have a duty to look at the public pound, how, how it's spent, naturally I was quite excited to see the 2014 update on the 2013 report card, which was very poor. And, convener, if I may say, I was a bit more than disappointed. Uh, little evidence that CPP boards are demonstrating any leadership uh, many CPPs not clear about what they're expected to achieve. CPPs don't yet know what a strategic approach to prevention will look like. No coherent national framework. And finally, convener, Scottish Government guidance is not clear enough about the role that CPPs should play. So, um, Councillor Jenny Laying, if I may say, and I'm, I'm aware of all the changes in Aberdeen in the past year, but the fact is that we have a 10-year report and we now have a one-year update on the 10-year report. So we're not just looking at what happened in the past year. We're looking at your report card for the past now 12 years. And to be honest, it's not good. And I, for one, I think I used the word, it's very frustrated at the lack of progress in the last uh, in for, uh, evidence session we had with the Auditor General, but uh, I'm actually just as disappointed to hear from you today about what you're going to do going forward. I mean, why? Why? There's plenty of excuses here, and even Douglas uh, Sinclair, uh, I asked him if the leadership needs to come from national government, and he said yes. So, I mean, why isn't this happening? There are no doubt about the benefits to... I'm not concerned about people working in silos. It's the benefit to the service user and the NHS patient, etc. They don't want to be buffeted around from one organisation to another. Why are we still struggling to get public services in Scotland to work together for the benefit of the public pound and the benefit of public services here? Why do we have such a disappointing report? Um, I mean, you're quite right that, uh, you know, when, when you look at the report um, since it started in 2003, it's disappointing, I think, what we see on paper. I think um, the difficulty is we, we concentrate a lot on the, the financial aspect, in my opinion, that um, it seems to me that the, the, the focus is on if we had a joint budget, then everything would be OK. Now, I think what's clear from the report that we've got is it's the buy-in from the leadership of the various organisations which will move the process forward, not a pot of money sitting in the middle. And I think we've seen it with things like I was being involved with the Early Years Collaborative, and that's a similar approach. We can all see the benefits of early intervention, but it's getting the commitment and buy-in from people to provide not just the financial aspects involved, but the capacity, i.e. in staff and resources in order to push those things forward. And I've seen that myself from being part of the, uh, the, the uh, 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 early years champion in Aberdeen, the frustrations that staff have on the ground that perhaps they don't feel they've got that support and buy-in from leadership. And I think we all have to take responsibility for that. Um, I mean, I can't obviously speak for borders because the reason that you've got the two of us here today is obviously because one is co-terminus with NHS and, and, and Aberdeen is not. And, uh, you you know, Susan will maybe want to come in. But I think that has caused NHS difficulties in the respect of trying to service three different community planning partnerships and the involvement and buy-in of staff in relation to that. What I would say is that um, because we concentrate a lot on the financial aspects, we maybe aren't, you know, we maybe don't sell ourselves enough when, when we come out to say the good practice that we've got going on. We've obviously heard about our community safety hub. And although, um, it, you know, it, it sounds like we're dealing with issues of antisocial behaviour, I actually think there's a lot of preventative work going in there by the uh, cooperation that we have from staff who sit around the table in relation to that from both our council perspective police, fire, we have NHS, social services are there and we are picking up very early on families who are perhaps in difficulties and things from those discussions where we can work with them going forward. So I think there are a lot of preventative um, um, aspects going on both within our 
um, community planning partnership, and I'm sure across the country. But the other thing is, it's about the outcomes and how we measure those. I think we are we're data rich, to be honest. All the organisations are collecting lots of data, but it's about joining that data up. It's about sharing that data to make sure that we can improve the outcomes for people going forward. I don't think we've done that very well in the past. That's the reason that we're obviously looking to make improvements like around that, and that's why we've brought analysts from our various uh, different partnerships who are sitting around the table to try and make sure that that's better as we move forward. I think we have got work to do. I can't speak for what's gone before, before I was part of it, but what I'm saying is that the people that I think we've got sitting around the table in Aberdeen now have a commitment to make improvements, improve the outcomes for people in our community. And it's also about getting community buy-in as well, because I think, um, you know, when I see what's gone before, that's maybe been lacking. We've tried to do that more in Aberdeen. We have our uh, Fairer Aberdeen board, which is, uh, used to be Fairer Scotland board, where we have community um, partners, who, you know, people from our uh, most deprived communities sitting around the table and, and deciding where that, where that money goes to. We're all, also very keen to get involved in the participatory budgetary um, uh, schemes that are on the go, and we've obviously put forward our uh, people for training in relation to that. So I think, you know, we have got a commitment going forward. If you ask me, has progress been quick enough? Probably not for our communities, but we need to deal with where we are now and how we move forward with that. I also think around the integration agenda, that has helped, I think, our cohesion with our NHS partners, because we've set up a, a, a well, we're now into the shadow board, but we had a TLG before that. We've appointed a joint, a joint accountable officer, which I think helps bring the two organisations together. And I think that will align budgets, as we've spoken about earlier, because at the end of the day, we cannot carry on doing the same as we've done before, especially in healthcare, because just the, the ageing population that we have, the budgets would be a third more than we would expect them to be at the moment. So we have to be looking at that preventative aspect as we move forward, and that's what we need to do when we get around the table. Susan Webb, do you want to come in on some of the points that... Sorry, can, we, can I just say that the, the issues raised by the Auditor General in the summary, I actually gave you five. I tried to keep it as brief as possible. I mean, we've got to analyse this and to see how we take it forward. But, you know, I wonder if you could address some of them. I mean, is it national leadership? Is it, do you know what's expected of you? You know, there are lots of criticisms here. Uh, it would be helpful if you could tell us, you know, how you're moving forward or what you think of the report, what needs to be done. Would you like me to... Uh, oh, sorry, can I ask Councillor Lee just to briefly come back in on that point and try and be succinct as you can and then I'll bring Susan mm -hmm. Lee in. Um, in my opinion, I don't think it's national government that needs to come in because I think the, the whole point of community planning is it's about locality. It's about um, you know, finding solutions and outcomes for the people living within communities, which will vary across Scotland. I think it, the, the leadership needs to come from within the community planning partnership. I do believe that we have, we have a clear vision in Aberdeen now. I think we're working towards that. But we need to, we need to refresh our, our single outcome agreement because... I don't think that, uh, that you know, uh, the, it, it's not indicative of the outcomes that we need. It's about demand-led rather than outcome-led, in my opinion. You're supposed to tie in with national priorities as well. Yes, I accept that. But I, I thought your point was about should the leadership be coming from the, from the national level, and I, I don't think so. I think it should be done at a local level. Susan Webb. Very much. Um, I'm sort of new to community planning within Aberdeen City as of, of this year, um, and having read all the audit reports, it it was helpful for me to get a, an overview of where we are doing well, but also where we can improve. From an NHS uh, perspective, we are very committed to uh, community planning. I think the um, integrated joint boards has helped us because we have got uh, local managers, uh, board members involved, but we through um, the NHS board are able to pull uh, across three community planning partners. 
Um, we have supported, um, in terms of the, the data, I, I agree uh, with Councillor Lane, um, in terms of the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, all three of our partners are, have pooled their intelligence resources to, together to undertake the Joint Strategic Needs Assessments. We're pulling our resources around evidence reviews to ensure that we are focusing our resources on things that will make the, the biggest difference and that we are committed to evaluation across the, the uh, region so that we can learn from different different approaches. Um, we've touched on budget. Um, again, there, we've got a number of examples where whilst we have not had universal shared budgets, we've got a number of budgets that have been put on the table for community planning partners with communities to agree the, the best means of dispersal. And we are able to identify um, some clear outcomes as a result of that investment. I guess one of the challenges I find is that I am also aware of a number of examples of good practice. However, when you speak to individuals on the ground, they may not necessarily um, badge those uh, as community planning. That's just people working together. So I think that is clearly, as we move forward, being clear of our priorities, the actions that are being uh, taken, and that we are able then to demonstrate that they are as a result of community planning as opposed to partners just working together. Just one uh, just my, uh, uh, final question, if I may, uh, convener. Uh, in the summary, page four, uh, paragraph three, Many CPPs are still not clear about what they're expected to achieve. Now, that was two months ago. So how can you measure outcomes and achievements when you don't know what you're expected to achieve? Um, I guess the, the issue is um, each of the individual partners are very clear about what we have to achieve. I think the process that we've outlined in the city is about um, trying to work through the multiplicity of approaches to agree that the key things that as partners, if we work together, we will achieve more. Um, from that, I guess I'm talking moving forward, um, as I've only recently joined community planning, um, it is our intention uh, to identify how we will measure so that, uh, you know, a year from now, if we are called back to this committee, we will be able to demonstrate the differences that we've been able to make. So, so before I bring in the superintendent, can I just, uh, Councillor Parker, can you just briefly comment on that same question? Yeah, I'm very happy to comment on that question. I think in 2013, mm -hmm. after the, the audit report that took place then, we sat down as a community planning partnership and said, OK, we have to deliver the SOE and, and other issues of, of that nature, but actually what's important to us locally? And we set as our community planning partnership uh, key priorities that we intend to deliver locally, and there are four of those um, that we are concentrating on. And a lot of our work now is around delivering on those four priorities and making sure that the partners are looking at that. We're also um, developing a performance framework so that we can look at those priorities and then measure ourselves against that. And we've already taken a pilot of that framework um, to our community planning partnership in September of last year. And, and very much, um, as Jenny was saying earlier, we've decided to tackle the problem locally. We've decided to focus locally. And if we're going to get change and we're going to make the CPP work, then it has to be, has to be driven by local commitment. But I, I mean, I, I would want to be very clear. I, I think there is absolutely good examples out there um, of, of joint working that has come about as a result of CPP. And and, and we have a number of joint services uh, and a number of, of examples where, you know, we are working with the partners very effectively um, to deliver. Just super, Watson, just very briefly, and then I'm going to bring yeah, in to it, it was to be brief, and it was just to go back to, to both points, I suppose. Uh, you know, I've been around the block in community safety and community planning more times than I care to remember. And I share some of those frustrations. I think it's rather subjective at times through leadership, people who are bought in who are not around the table. And I suppose you ask, can National do more? Yeah, I think the sharing of best practice, promulgating that out to the 32 local authorities, and we're all receptive to hear that, the, the sharing of what's the experiences that are working in borders, and can we transfer them up to Aberdeen, et cetera, et cetera. And I think there's more that can be done there. I think, going back to the Aberdeen example, we're in a better place than we've ever been, and I say that having been involved in this for about 10 years now. I think, again, being subjective, we've got a chief executive in place that, like me and like the others here, believes passionately in community planning, so we've got a structure. But it's down to leadership to breathe uh, life into it, you know, and give that scrutiny and all that's expected and the questions that were rightly asked. And the proof will be in the pudding. 
uh, as, as we work through that. But certainly, early indications are we now have a structure. As Jenny rightly says, we are refreshing our uh, uh, single outcome agreement. It will be far more focused. The qualitative will correlate with the quantitative, and, and we'll work through that. But there are still challenges out there. I, I accept the points that were made. And I think it's important we stress that you know, we see these challenges day in, day out. Thank you. Tavi Scott. Yeah, you know, um, Audit Scotland have expressed some concern about priorities. So I wanted to start by asking both Jenny Lang and David Parker, as the chairs of their respective um, community planning partnerships, what is the main public sector challenge that you face right now, either in Grampian or in the borders? OK, who wants to... Who's coming in first? Jenny Lang? Um, I think probably in Aberdeen it is a financial aspect, to be frank with you. Um, we are the lowest funded council. You'll have heard us say that on a number of occasions. NHS are in a similar position. Um, so it's difficult because we have competing priorities. Uh, but that should be making us work harder, in my opinion, because we need to make sure that the finances that we have go as far as possible. If that means partnership working, um, then you know, it can achieve more for uh, the money that we have, then that's the line that we should be going down. And I think that's what we do have at the heart of, of, of what we're doing, both in the council and other public sector organisations, and also the voluntary sector as well, because we haven't spoken about that. We've obviously got representatives here um, from other areas, but the voluntary sector is very important important in Aberdeen. They are a committed partner within uh, our community planning partnership. Um, and, you know, uh, we, we, we need to be working closely um, to ensure that we're we are delivering for our communities and uh, closing the gap, which is uh, uh, the equality gap within Aberdeen, because we have areas of great wealth, but also areas of great poverty. And that's uh, difficult and challenging for us when we're could I just, Before I bring it in, could I just tease that out? So I totally accept that's your analysis of, of your biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. Is it therefore the community planning partnership in, in Grampian's number one objective? Do you all come together uh, to discuss how to tackle that problem that you've identified, presumably right across all the agencies, as the most significant challenge that you face? Mm -hmm. Is the community planning partnership, in other words, the forum by which you take action on that, collectively take action on that issue? Yeah, well, I think that's where we have all the partners around the table. We obviously have partnership working. I've mentioned about the integration with NHS, but that's where we're working with one or two partners, whereas the community planning, I see we have all partners around the table, and that's, that's where I think we can evolve and, and, and actually produce the plans which we can all be working in order to, to make the differences within our local communities. OK. And I just wanted to contrast... So I apologise to David Parker. I wanted to contrast the... The assessment of finance being the underpinning problem that you face in the, in the Grampian area across the agencies with, at the moment, national priority, which is integrating health and social care. Um, how, which is number one do you, do you, for your community planning partnership? Um, I think they go hand in hand, to be perfectly frank, because I think um, one thing we haven't mentioned is the, the health village that we have in Aberdeen, and I think it touches on the preventative aspect. It shows where we've worked very well with um, NHS to produce a facility within the centre of town, which is offering not just diagnostic services, but actual preventative services where people can come in and there's health and social care um, advice and things within that. So I think it's about us being smarter with the resource that we have, whether that be the, the capacity and through staffing or, uh, in actual fact, buildings that we have to co-locate services and uh, get economies of scale in that respect, as well as the, how we uh, utilise our budgets to the best degree. But it is a, it's about preventative spend, in my opinion, and early intervention. Yeah, and does that mean that, that national politics, a sort of national policy around integrating health and social care is on the agenda for your community planning partnership on, you know, on the regular cycle of meetings in terms of how that's going and how that's progressing? Yes, we do have that both at the board level and at the management yeah. uh, group level as well. Um, you know, they had a meeting just this week where we were obviously looking at the draft um, integration scheme that we are c currently consulting and you, on. And because of Audit Scotland's worries about all this, do you, do you find that model is pushing partners very hard on whether they're delivering on something that's, after all, a key objective of government? Yes, I think it's helped to bring us, bring it, the, the yeah. cohesion there and bring, bring us together as a partnership, yeah. yes. Okay, thank you very much. I wonder if I could ask David to... 
I mean, very similar. I mean, I think um, I think every local government leader would tell you that the, the financial challenges and the financial climate at the moment is, is driving all of our thinking, is, and it's the thing that we, we concentrate heavily on. In terms of the, the CPP, one of our, our one of our key priorities is reducing inequalities and trying to get preventative spend in there. And we're doing a lot of work with the partners now, where we've done a huge audit of mapping out all the quality issues we have in the borders, looking at all the services we provide, and trying to target our resource to the families and communities who we're all working with. And that's involved you know, a huge sharing of data and a huge amount to work. In terms of, of um, health and social care integration, very significant priority, but, not, but I, I, you know, it's not one that I, I would say is a challenge. We've got a very good relationship with NHS Borders and the partners in, in um, social care and health, and um, that is coming together um, very well. The, the, the big issue with, with all of these issues is that, that change takes a very long time. The one thing I've learned in all the years I've done this job is that you know, change can take quite some time. And actually, the challenge of getting joined up services and working together just takes a while to, to deliver, you know, and, and um, it, it's almost trying to keep pace of all the changes that we're needing to make to deal with the financial issues that we have at the moment. That in itself is, is as much a challenge as anything. Do you find uh, that where government decides to, in, to introduce a policy like integrating health and social care, David Parker, that mm. that uh, then goes to the top of the list as opposed to local priorities where you may have decided in conjunction with your health board colleagues in the borders that you were going to do X, Y and Z? It, it absolutely can. I mean, there's no question that, that national policies from government can mean that we, we have to shift resources. Um, and, and social care and health is a great example where significant amount of work has been done in that area. We've been waiting for the legislation to move on. We've been waiting for um, you know guidance to be given on different aspects of things. And certainly that can have an impact on, on what we all do and you know there's only there's only so many hours in the day and at the end of the day you know the NHS whether you're housing and social whatever you've still got your core services to, look, to deliver plus all the local priorities that our, our community planning partnership might agree and what government is seeking to try and deliver so you know there's only so many people in so many hours in a day. Can I just the final question are we asking you to do too many things? Um, I have always felt that we have an awful lot of legislation in this country um, and, and that legislation comes along quite quickly. And certainly, you know, there, there are times when some breathing space in the agenda would be appreciated. Thank you very much for that candour. David Torrance. Yeah, I'll come back in later. Just okay. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everybody. Um, can you tell me how much engagement community plan partnerships have had with local communities and local stakeholders to ensure that they're delivering for local needs. Okay. Now, Mr. Rain, you're indicating you wanted to come in there, so you might want to... Really want to come in on... Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, you uh, can maybe capture both points at the same time, then. OK, uh, well, if yeah. I can re revert to the, uh, the earlier question, which was, uh, what, are the, what, are the prior, what, are the, what are the pressures that we, we face? In the NHS, of course, it's, uh, it's funding. It's also in the borders demographics. Um, older age uh, population, higher demands on the health service, and that pushes us to obviously look at redesigning services using our money in better ways. Uh, but the whole issue about, uh, uh, or the benefit that community planning partnerships can bring is the way in which we can actually use resources, maybe in relatively small ways, to better effect. And if I can give you one small example, um, which is on the table at the moment um, and is uh, now likely to be funded by uh, and it's small amounts of money from health, from police, from the council. And that's the, the issue of dealing or looking at how we might uh, uh, be more cost effective in the way that we deal with problem families, problem families in the sense of uh, the very few families that exist who create uh, a lot of uh, demand on the public uh, uh, service, not just health, police, resource, education, uh, care, uh, maternity issues, uh, education and so on. Um, and we have a project now which is under the Community Planning Partnership to identify uh, those particular families very much in conjunction with the police. And it's really uh, a case of saying, let's stop and consider what, what's going in to support these families and to reduce the impact on the public purse. Uh, and let's see if we can do this in a better way. Let's see if we can coordinate the amount of effort that goes in. Let's see if we can improve the lives of those family members. 
Um, and these are it clearly is going to be a very tailored project. It will focus on one individual family, a large family, uh, overcrowded housing, all the kind of social issues that you would expect uh, in that environment. Um, and the, the relatively small amounts of money that are needed from all of the, the partnership bodies uh, to contribute to provide a coordinated resource, um, a social work coordination. Uh, and personally, I think that's, that's money well spent in a small way that is using our resources in a more effective way. Uh, it depends on the outcome, of course, and uh, once this project is underway, it's going to have to be measured to see what, uh, what it delivers. But it's a small imaginative scheme. It's not uh, unique. It happens in one other area in Scotland, and it happens in England. But that's a way of using our collective strength and skills and experience and professionalism and resource, uh, bringing that to bear on a particular circumstance and being more creative in the way that we spend our money. It's yeah. a small so, example. I appreciate I brought you in on the point, but could you, you also get the opportunity to respond to David's... Uh, yeah, OK. Uh, I mean, David Parker will talk about community councils and uh, area forums. Uh, there are uh, area forums now established across the borders. Uh, I've given a commitment that the NHS will be part of those forums. Uh, Non-executive board members will ten attend those forum meetings. So we have that dialogue. And I think, the, in a way, communication starts at the top. And we've recently initiated uh, a process where the NHS will come and present uh, on some of the issues that face us to the full council. Uh, we were in the council chamber a few weeks ago, our medical director and myself, uh, speaking to the whole council about uh, our current issues about our need to redesign our clinical services um, and this is engagement at that level uh, and we've done that before with the uh, with, with the clear uh, benefit of uh, improving dialogue and with the consent of the council because they have a very busy uh, full council meeting agenda and I think that kind of communication at the top needs to be reflected down across the communities of the borders. Don't yeah. underestimate yeah. the difficulty. Let me ask both Councillor, thanks Mr. Lane. Could you just ask Councillor Parker to respond to that and perhaps Councillor Lane? Um, we, and we've had, we, we, have, we have absolutely had engagement with some communities around the community planning partnership table. So one of our priorities in relation to inequalities in some of those communities such as Langley <laughs> in Gala Shields or Burnfoot and Hoyk where um, a significant amount of work is going on to tackling inequalities. Could planning partnership has been very active in those communities and is delivering joint work. In relation to the wider borders public, um, I, you know, I, I, I suspect there is not, um, you know, there hasn't been uh, that degree of engagement that, that maybe people would seek. We are currently developing as part of our area forum network a, a sort of new approach where we're going to have local community planning plans that will link to our community planning partnership, but that is very much at the, the you know, it's very much at the beginning of its development just now and it will be rolled out um, later on in the year across the five area forum areas in the Scottish borders. Okay. Councillor Lang. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, again, we've got various things. Um, I'll, I'll maybe start with an initiative that was obviously at Aberdeen City Council in relation to our budgetary um, issues. Um, we have priority-based budgeting. We've had that for the last five years. And we uh, undertook um, a great deal of engagement with uh, not just local communities, but uh, key stakeholders as well around that and the, and the issues in shaping that budget up. Um, now, based on that, we've obviously got other things. The City Voice as a panel, which we use three times a year. We go out to them with questions on various aspects. Um, in relation to community planning. Um, we've got the Civic Forum, who are a member of our community planning uh, partnership, who represent community councils and other community groups operating there. Um, and we support them in, their, in the work that they do. Regeneration Matters is a, community, a group of community representatives, which we have from our regeneration areas. And we obviously um, engage with them on various aspects. So um, you know, I, I think as far as community engagement goes, we have various means in which we are doing that, and we would want to, to build on that and continue to use that as we go forward. David Thomas, you want to come back? Okay. 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 Shoot McMillan, and then 
Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, panel. Um, obviously, I'm going to, my questions will be focused upon the, uh, the Audit Scotland uh, report, uh, but uh, the panellists will be aware of the, the Local Government and Regeneration Committee uh, here that they've undertaken a tremendous amount of work uh, on the Public Services Reform, and they produced a report in uh, June 2012. So some of the questions I will pose uh, actually can emanate from that particular report, but my, my questions will be focused upon the Audit Scotland report. In, uh, on paragraph 25 uh, of the report, um, it, uh, also, it talks about the issue of the partners need to create a more effective leadership challenge and scrutiny role in CPP boards. Uh, and it goes on to say that uh, support is required for CPPs to develop the skills and culture that are needed to create effective challenge within CPP boards. What support um, do you think is required to actually assist uh, with that recommendation? Does anybody want to direct that to show? Uh, to anyone in the panel. Is there anyone in the panel that wants to specifically respond to that? I think, I mean, I, I, Parker. I, yeah, very happy to, to try and have a shot at uh, responding to that. I mean, the way in which our community planning partnership works, we, we obviously decide what our priorities are. We, we have various different groups underneath that of officers across all the organisations who are delivering on those priorities and doing the day-to-day -day work. They report back to the CHCP board, giving progress on the work that's being undertaken and what we've asked them to do. And, and we monitor that, and, and the board challenges that, you know, when it's appropriate. But um, we have very good um, working relationships. The, the, the partner organisations are very clear about delivering the priorities that we've set and, and what needs to be done. And certainly since 2013, very good progress is being made on them. And I, I think um, you know, the board will ask questions about priorities. They will ask questions about bits of work that maybe aren't, aren't going to, to, to time scale. But I, I, I don't recognise um, the, the issue around there being a difficulty with the board scrutinising the work of the, the CPP. They, they very much do do that. They're very interested in it and certainly we've been very careful to try and develop um, this new performance framework where we've got very clear indicators of, of how we're delivering against our priorities uh, and that, that's something that the board certainly wanted to do. Okay. Anyone else? Anybody else the panel? Yeah, Ms McKinnon. Uh, could I just elaborate on that a little? Um, Scottish Enterprise is involved in 27 of the uh, community planning partnerships across Lowland Scotland um, and we have 18 of our most senior staff involved there. I personally am involved with four. Um, this may sound a rather strange thing to say, but uh, I don't know that much about health and social care because it's not my background, but I think that enables me um, through the community planning partnership boards to actually be liberated to ask the stupid question and perhaps bring a different perspective to the thinking that's around the table. So for example, um, Quite a lot of the conversation around borders community planning uh, partnership is around the issues about health and social care in relation to demographics and increasing demand on, on uh, public services. So in that environment, uh, I have found myself in the situation where I've asked the question about, well, what are the opportunities for the local community in relation to that ageing population? What are the opportunities for businesses to actually provide services either to the local community or what are the, the opportunities for the area as a whole in terms of people coming to choose um, uh, and retire in the borders? Similarly, in Dumfries and Galloway, there's the same similar sort of conversations. Uh, but an example I would give you there is, um, as you probably know, there's a new health, uh, a new hospital about to be built in Dumfries. Um, the community planning uh, board have obviously been involved in the conversations around about that. And you probably also know that the contract has been let to Lang O'Rourke and they're going to use a completely uh, innovative construction methodology which is involves off-site construction. Now, the knock-on from that is that the local construction industry's skills are not appropriate for that construction uh, technology. Um, so the community planning board there have had a conversation between NHS and the council uh, and the college, which has resulted in Dumfries and Galloway College developing new courses which are about technician skills for people um, to be able to take on employment within that construction project. That wouldn't have come about, I don't believe, if that hadn't been discussed at community planning. Um, and it kind of came out, came out of the blue, to be entirely honest. But it's uh, an important um, 
aspect to community planning, which is all about the conversations that happen around and people looking at things from a, a non-conventional angle. Anyone else? Yeah. Just very briefly, if I may, Chair, you know, in terms of the Aberdeen, again, the experience very similar to the borders. I think, uh, particularly in the last year, I've seen a real step change in terms of the leadership uh, within the community plan in Aberdeen, and that scrutiny is there, you know, and that's reflected in the minutes. So there is an evidence base there as well that you can see we're almost turning the corner in many respects, and we are making the challenge across the partners. And I, thought, I think there's some uh, foundation being built around about collaborating for outcomes. That's local courses up there for all our leaders and potential leaders coming through that to engender that trust and build on it and, and nurture it across the partners for once we're coming around the table and learning together on these strategic issues and the shared priorities that matter to the local communities. And it's stuff round about the training at the strategic and dare I say down at the, the tactical, the, the middle management level, that's really been quite interesting because you're starting to see the fruit of your labours as people come through now. The trust has been built and it seems not quite a seamless transition at times, but folk are coming round the table and speaking as one as part of that team Aberdeen ethos sitting under the 2022 20, vision. But again, a lot of that is just management words, dare I say, but I think we're starting to see it, as I say, play through with some of the stuff we're now doing around about the single outcome agreement, some of the initiatives, very good initiatives we're doing in terms of getting upstream and, and trying to play out Christy with the preventative spend round about the community safety. You know, we speak about the hub, we speak about the work we're doing in Torrey round about domestic abuse, where all the partners are rallying to the cause. I wouldn't have necessarily seen that enthusiasm and vigour two or three years back. So certainly going in the right direction, but it is that trainer, training underpinning the right people now, dare I say, in community planning in Aberdeen to take us on that course. Um, the, the report uh, highlights the issue of, uh, uh, of the data and the better use of data. Uh, and, and I accept that uh, also different organisations uh, will have maybe their own, uh, their own systems that they operate with. Uh, so there may well be challenges. But uh, has there been any, any work uh, been looked at or examined to try to utilise the data that each of the organisations actually has? to actually better use that? Is there, are there any technical solutions, uh, any pieces of software that have been considered to, uh, to be uh, introduced uh, that actually could utilise this data uh, better? Um, Susan Webb. Uh, yeah, I can uh, maybe kick off. Again, as just someone that is uh, relatively new to this, I guess there's a number of actions that we've um, undertaken. We've got a memorandum of understanding which allows us to share data in the, the first place. Um, we are trying to set out what we call as a sort of tiered intelligence approach, where we make sure that our frontline staff have the information they need to manage their services day on a day-to-day -day basis, but also um, reducing the amount of data that we look at um, to ensure that we focus on the absolute indicators that will give us a, a, um, a sense of whether we're moving towards our strategic outcomes. In terms of um, what can we do to facilitate the data sharing, we're working with some national bodies to enable us to, to do that. And we're currently in discussion about what we need to put in place so that we can uh, link data where it's appropriate to link data. And we're also working with um, our local university colleagues utilising safe havens to enable us to do surveillance and link a number of big data sets um, across a, a number of of partners. Um, we do have some examples, I think, at a local level, particularly in the uh, community safety agenda, uh, where pulling data together has enabled us to um, shape up some of our uh, domestic uh, violence uh, projects so that it is a much more partnership uh, approach because it's pulling the intelligence that's given us a better insight into uh, what we need to tackle. Serene. Yeah, d data sharing is, of course, so, uh, so important. And we all hold data as NHS, as uh, local authorities, and uh, there's a lot of uh, sharing of data uh, across the uh, community planning partners. Uh, the public health function, by the way, we have a joint uh, director of public health, uh, joint between health and local authority. Uh, but public health has been working uh, very closely with uh, the community planning partners. Uh, to develop a, a local reducing inequality strategy. Um, 
and the partnership has been able to use data from a whole range of sources across the partners, plus uh, national surveys, local surveys, trying to understand the characteristics of uh, inequalities in the borders as they relate to health and well-being. Um, and also the other uh, key strategic aims of, uh, of the partnership around economic education, community safety and so on. So there's a lot of data sharing that's gone into the production or the development of the reducing inequalities strategy. Um, the partnership now needs to consider, or the joint uh, delivery team now needs to consider how all this shared data on inequalities can be best used to inform the delivery of services and uh, working closely with local communities. But that's a very good example of uh, using uh, data to produce a strategy, particularly around health inequalities. And now we need to move to the next step, okay. having got the data, to how we move forward to uh, deliver our yeah. objectives. Just a brief yeah. contribution, Mr. Watson, and then one final question from Stuart. Nice it will be brief again. You know, if we're to be informed, we need the data. And I have to say, I'm no technocrat, but I have a chief executive in Aberdeen City Council that has far more knowledge. She's really keen to, to extract all the data from all the organisations, and she has all that software, hardware, names that uh, I can only dream of, I suppose. But she has a, an idea of where we need to get to. The challenge for me in frustration over the years has been that, you know, we as an organisation, Police Scotland, and before that, Grampian Police, we're pretty keen to share data, you know, and some of that is very sensitive. Uh, and other partners have come round and rallied to the cause, but there are still one or two, notably, you know, that still find it a challenge. And there, there are cultural and leadership issues there that we still need to, to, to work through in certain areas, uh, if I'm to be honest round about that. But we have data sets now that we, we didn't have a few years ago. And of course, that helps us inform a strategic assessment, which gives us an objective view on what our priorities are for the city, but there's more that could be done around the edges to, to give that richer picture. Okay, thank you. And um, it was touched upon earlier regarding the issue of sharing of best practice between the CPPs. Uh, and uh, also in recent times, uh, COSLA uh, produced uh, the benchmarking tool, uh, which I uh, warmly welcome, uh, and I know that certainly will uh, help uh, going forward. Um, do you think a similar tool would be useful for CPPs, or do you think the the utilisation of the, the benchmarking tool um, itself will actually assist the CPPs going forward. Okay. You watch the okay. Councillor Parker. Um, I think the benchmarking data is very helpful and the benchmarking work that's been done is, is useful, but I, I would always say that, that the sharing of best practice um, in whatever field you're in is, is very welcome. And, and I think um, any advice that um, Audit Scotland has uh, or anyone has to give us in relation to best practice in CPPs across the country is very useful. It's something that we all, you know, we all learn from and we all look to replicate. Um, so you know, that would be very welcome. Okay, Mary Scanlon referred to the, you know, the report card that we've had over time, um, and this latest report card, you know, continues to show that we're not uh, making the progress in community planning that we would like to be making. And I suppose um, the first question I, I would ask would be for some insight from the panel on, um, essentially, what, what are the examples? Um, of that lack of progress, because quite understandably, and I, I know the reasons why, but people have given the uh, examples of, well, it's not as bad as all that, and here is a, a good example. Uh, Chief Superintendent Watson referred to the Community Hub. Mr McKinnon gave a, an interesting example about some of the innovative things you do. What are the actual, uh, in your views, from your own experience of being involved in community planning, what are the, the practical consequences? Um, uh, or, or, or even, I think we probably understand the practical consequences, but, but what are the factors that lead to, to us not being able um, to achieve things, and what kind of specific examples are those? Because uh, otherwise, I, I can't square that we keep getting these reports from the Auditor General saying, you know, these boards are not uh, performing as well as they should. They don't have a clear enough um, uh, sense of what they should be doing. And the overall report card, as Mary Scanlon says, is, you know, it certainly isn't improving anywhere near fast enough. Um, but the people in the leadership positions in the boards are, are just uh, on the community plan partnerships are just pointing to. The, the, the good examples, which undoubtedly, undoubtedly exist, but they should exist. Um, so is anyone willing to share where, where it does go wrong? Can I just give, a, if I may chair, just a general overview from my perspective over the years? It, it has to be day business. This is not a bolt-on, you know, and I still believe that I want to, at a strategic level, feel it is that. 
you know, and this has to reflect in our respective organisations, business plans, you know, all our priorities, day in, day out. That's got to be felt by staff in a very positive sense, because that's what the organisations across the public sector, third sector and business sector in Scotland are about, you know, encouraging, empowering. I'm not necessarily sure that's felt, you know, to that level yet, and it is seen as that additional work. I think it's getting better. I think we're maturing in many respects, but until you reach that, where it's reflected in, for instance, in my organisation through the Aberdeen City Policing Plan, which it is, and it's tangible and it's there, and people are striving day in and day out, and dare I say being appraised on it, here's the city vision, here's a single outcome agreement, and here's where you fit, Bobby, on the street in Aberdeen City. Until they actually feel that, I don't think we'll make the ground that you're looking for. In fact, we're all looking for. Um, I, I would agree. Um, I would agree with that. And I think one of the big issues is, is genuinely having capacity within all the different organisations to deliver everything they have to do. So, you know, there's the core functions that we all have to deliver, and then there's you know, government priorities and our own priorities and all the different strands of work that we're working on at any one time. And, and capacity is an issue. So, I, I think sometimes progress is slower than we would like because we just don't have the capacity to do everything that is being asked of us across all the different things that we're delivering. by Douglas Sinclair to, uh, to the committee that we need to get out of the mindset that community planning is the Saturday job. Um, I don't see it as that, obviously, and I don't think that's the way it operates in borders. Um, but as David Parker says, there are so many day-to-day -day pressures uh, that uh, we, we, we have to deliver on our key mainstream targets for mainstream services. Uh, but we, I, we, we, we're not going to change that overnight. I think up to now there's been an over-reliance on the local authority. And uh, I think in health we have, certainly in my area, tended to rely on the council to provide the administrative structure, the organisation, uh, keep the machinery going, uh, perhaps to an unfair extent. And uh, I would look hopefully to the community, community empowerment bill uh, to perhaps shift that uh, axis somewhat because it will give statutory uh, uh, authority to all the partners to contribute to community planning. And whilst the council I think will always have that pivotal role, I think we've got to be very careful that the other partners don't uh, see it as solely the council's job to do. Mr uh, McCann? It's just an observation. I mean, I, uh, I mentioned earlier that Scottish Enterprise is involved in 27 community planning partnerships. Um, when I talk to my colleagues about their experience in community planning partnerships, um, a common theme pops out. Um, and that theme is about um, the common thread that runs through each of those partnerships where things are working well. And it's not about the structures, it's not about the governance of the partnership, it's not about the SOA, it's not about the, the bureaucracy of community planning, and, and, and there is quite a bit of that. Uh, the common um, thread that pops out is where um, the partners in that area um, have reached a common understanding of a particular issue. And you've got to bear in mind that many of them come from completely different perspectives. And when they have reached a common understanding of that particular issue, then coalesce around a series of actions which relate to that issue. And that doesn't necessarily mean, as men mentioned earlier, um, you know, joint budgets or joint activities. It, it's aligned resources. So partner A does this bit, partner B does that bit, but it's all part of a greater whole in relation to the particular thing that's being done. And there are many successes across Scotland, some of them big, some of them small, but that's what my colleagues tell me. Quite interesting. I wonder if we'd get other, um, the other members of the panel to reflect on it, because I mean, I have to be honest with you, um, people, um, I mean, the, the panel, the people on the panel, you're, you're all in leadership positions in the delivery of our, our public services, and the people that uh, in your own communities and among communities will look to people like yourselves as being the key decision makers. Uh, and the people who are, who are ultimately responsible and, um, uh, you know, to great and lesser extents accountable um, for these decisions. And it, it doesn't, you know, if, when people come to me and say, oh, well, 
know, my elderly relative is, you know, is delayed um, getting out of hospital, or I'm having difficulty um, dealing with an issue of antisocial behaviour because the council keep telling me to speak to the police and the police keep telling me to speak to the housing provider. And, you know, th those are all the examples of, of community planning um, failing. And, and if I respond to them and say, well, see, the problem is there's, there's, um, you know, there's not buy-in at the appropriate levels of leadership in the public services, or there's, there's, there's not significant enthusiasm for collective working um, at the strategic level, they're not going to be very satisfied with those answers. Um, I, and, it, and it goes back to, to Mary Scanlon's point about, you know, this is, this, this is not a new process. I can understand, um, you know, that these things take time and, uh, and we seek to get better over time. But after 10 years, to be, to be responding and just saying it's about, it's about culture, it's about whether or not the individuals in the room pattern to get on or whether or not they have a similar and shared understanding of, of the challenges that they face in the local communities. Is that really good enough? Yep, you asked the challenges, you know, and, and, and I gave you that, that example, and that's still my experience to, to an extent. But I think we have, you know, we've moved considerably from where we've been over that 10, 12 years. And you, know, you speak about the example, and if I may throw it back, the antisocial behaviour, council speaking to police, police speaking to council. That was my experience in Aberdeen. I dare say it was replicated across the 32 local authorities that we were working in silos. But you give me the opportunity to go back and speak about a living, breathing example of where community planning has worked in Aberdeen, and that is the community safety hub. Yeah. Where on that day-to-day -day basis, that council and that police employee, the third sector, the fire, health, will sit around a table and have a daily meeting effectively playing through all the community safety issues that folk are phoning in about or complaining about over the past 24 hours and looking forward somewhat you know, into the future. And we're seeing that now as a tangible, successful story of community planning, where all the trusts and the commitment given by the partners through resource, not any financial outlay as such, the only financial outlay aside from the resource is the computers and the place itself, and that's been kindly given by Aberdeen City Council. So it's modest, you know, but we've had to come round the table. And that's been nurtured through community planning, down through community safety. The governance has been given. And day to day, we've seen uh, significant reductions, you know, just not in terms of figures, but certainly quality of feedback in terms of safety across the city that should make us all rather enthused and proud with what we have. And I suppose a slight frustration for me is to see how that plays out nationally. And can we share that experience and look elsewhere to take other living, breathing, positive experiences back up to Aberdeen? And I still see the landscape. Well, there's a dearth of, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the success stories. And I still think many of them are happening, but we're not perhaps sharing them. And naturally, we're quite reticent in the North East to share all the positive experiences that we have. But there is much happening that we're very proud of locally in Aberdeen. So it's not a black picture as such. I give a generalisation. I still think at times there is a feeling that it is an add-on to the day job. And I was trying to give a, a signpost, I suppose, from my perspective, that we all need to come round the table and see this as day business. And if we're serious about it, and we all are, and we're very passionate, certainly I can speak for the city, that it needs to find its way into our individual organisations' business plans, that we are as one. What are the priorities? The SOA is the priority for Police Scotland and Aberdeen City. And how does that 2022 vision play through right down to the Bobby in the street? And do they understand what they are doing in terms of that collective effort to making the place a bit safer? Thank you very much, convener, and good morning, colleagues. Um, I was a bit concerned when we, when we started that this was going to be a very defensive session. Um, and I'm grateful that it, in many ways, hasn't been, because I think as I take uh, stock of the notes that I've made here, I could write up a pretty good, a, a pretty good resume of what you need to do to get to get the uh, planning partnership to work well, and, and and that's now on the record. But I'd like to to carry on just where Drew Smith was because it wasn't quite said, and I don't want to put words into people's mouths, but it was very nearly said that there's a duty to be part of it, but there's no duty to do anything. And the counter to that has come from discussions about passionate leadership and recognizing that it mustn't be part of the day job, which I think is absolutely fair. But I'm just wondering whether you could reflect, please, on the structural position that you are in, reflect that people move on, 
changes do happen. You know, good, not so good leadership is hopefully moved out, but anyway, good leaders move on. Um, so it can't be based around the people you're currently working with because in a couple of years' time, some of them will have gone. Um, it can't be based on things on the back of a fact packet. You know, you and I agree we're going to do this and that. The structure has to be there, and I'm, I'd like to go right back to the absolute basic, which is, as I understand it, you have a facility to work, you have a desire to work, you are asked to work together, but actually at the end of the day, if council leader or NHS leader or one or two other local police chief wants to get in the way, there's nothing really to force them to cooperate. Now, could I ask, first of all, is my analysis correct? And if I am right there, is there anything we should be doing here to ensure that these things do just simply get better and get embedded and aren't stopped by yeah. individual people not playing ball? Councillor Lane. I think from what we've heard around the table today that your analysis is correct, that that, that has been a, a stumbling block, I would say, in the past. I think it's what Adrian mentioned earlier. I think it's, it's about ownership within the the different partner organisations as well, and I think it's about embedding that within our own strategic plans, um, and, and that is that's where we'll see the continuity. No matter who is in in the leadership role, if it is embedded within that plan as you move forward, then obviously I would expect that to then be uh, you know um, fulfilled by whoever comes into that role. I think the other problem that we have, and it's around the data and whether we, we gather the information, but we live in a very immediate world now. We want to see results right away. People want to see um, you know, that the actions that we're taking are having an effect. And uh, we're always under pressure in order to you know, satisfy people about the, how we are spending money and whether it's making a difference to people's lives. So I think we need that buy-in from people that in this situation, a lot of this, especially around the preventative uh, spend that we're looking at, it will take some years in order to filter through before we see the full benefits of that. And that's why I think we need to have faith and it needs to be embedded within people's long-term strategic plans in order for us to continue on that journey and not just say, well, we haven't got the results uh, in a year's time, um, so we're, we're going to stop that. And I think we've seen it with some of the pilot funding and things because it's perhaps been on a yearly basis or something that the results at the end of that don't substantiate, you know, um, perhaps continuing and it's difficult for the partners to then say let's mainstream the finance in order to do that. So I think it's about us having faith but also people out there having, um, you know, uh, a bit of patience around that so that we can actually bring forward and demonstrate that the changes that we have made have had a, a positive impact on communities. No, so, Councillor Lingmo, could can we maybe come back on that point and just elaborate on it slightly, though, because I think it was a very focused question on mm -hmm. personalities. Obviously, the process is working because of the people who are involved in that. I think, I mean, can you focus on the question that Nigel Don asked, which was, if personalities move on, does the process continue? So but, that, I, well, I, I think if it's embedded properly within your strategic plans and it feeds in from community planning and then into the plans of the individual partnership organisations, then I think it, it should continue because people should continue with those long-term plans. I think we've seen it within the council itself. I mentioned earlier about our priority-based budgeting and we've seen a change in the po political um, complexion of the council, but that budgeting process continues because there was buy-in at an early stage around that. And I mean, obviously, in our community planning partnership, we have um, all political persuasions sitting around the table, which I think helps us as we go forward because we are the ones that change most um, because we're in, uh, elected, obviously, going um, from year to year. But I think if it is if it is within the strategic plans of organisations, there is a better chance of that continuing while the personalities may change. Yeah. May, I, may I just come back on that? Because, yes, there is a better chance. I, mm -hmm. I, I take your point. Thank you for the answer. I don't want to see a better chance. Our job as, as MSPs is to set up a structure which is going to work. I mean, I accept that, but what I'm saying to you is we, we, we'll carry out programmes, we'll have preventative spending things, we then have to look at the outcomes of that, whether they've achieved what we wanted them to achieve. Um, now, it may be that when we look at it, that perhaps 
different decisions would have given us better outcomes. For, and people me. will always have to have that flexibility <laughs> to, to change that. For, forgive me uh, for interrupting. Yeah, I, I entirely recognise that you will do your level best and sometimes mm. it won't work. That, that's not mm. what worries me. What does concern me is that at the parliamentary level within national legislation that we should set up structures which are not going to rise or fall or the effectiveness is not going to be significantly determined by the individual who's actually in a place, be it a council leader or a NHS chief executive or whatever. And, and I come back to my basic thesis that at the moment, and I'll repeat it, there's a duty to be involved, but there's not a duty actually to do anything. Should we change legislation in such a way, and I don't know quite what, don't quote me on the words, I don't know quite what we should do, but should we set up a structure and legislation that requires organisations actually to achieve something through this? Councillor Parker, take him in in that. I think he's indicating. Our experience in the Scottish Borders is that we have never had any difficulty bringing the partners around the table, and we've never had any um, deliberate obstruction or anybody saying, I don't want to play or do this. We've never had that. Um, we, we've had organisations who maybe take longer to do a piece of work than we would like because of capacity issues, but we've never had any difficulty bringing the partnership together and having a good relationship. We've always um, had quite a lot of self evaluation built in, so we're, we were keen to be a Pathfinder authority and, and go and, and be audited uh, for the 2013 report. We evaluate ourselves on a regular basis. We're currently doing an evaluation at the moment um, and asking ourselves, is the current structure working? Is the, is the current leadership right? Is there anything we should change? And that will come back um, to our partnership later on this year and I, I, we will probably make changes. But certainly we, we have always had very good engagement around the table and I have never come across obstruction at all um, from any of the partners that have been there. We've also, got, we've also had a very stable environment in the Scottish borders. Um, and we, we, we fortunately, for whatever reason, you know, we haven't had the, the political um, changes that some authorities go through. I've been leader of the council for 12 years. Um, so, you know, we've had a stable environment um, in that period of time and a stable environment in our partners. And, and actually, that, that kind of collaboration and working together and coming together has worked very well. And I've never, I've never found a partner who said, you know, I, I don't want to be here. Sabrine, and then one final question from Nigel Dunn. It's a very good one. It's about future-proofing yeah. uh, the performance of uh, community planning partnerships. And whilst David and I will tell you how good things are in the borders, um, you know, we, we, and that relies upon leadership and others uh, across the, the partnership board who sit around the table, we won't be there forever and a day. Um, and maybe we've got to look at uh, better scrutiny arrangements in health, we are held to account through our local uh, delivery plan annually. There is a section now that requires us to report our performance and our contribution to community planning. Um, but you may not see that as sufficient scrutiny or accountability. And maybe because of the nature of community planning partnerships, they are local and they should be allowed to determine their own local priorities. And maybe that scrutiny is best coming from the locality. And if we have uh, other people sitting around the table uh, from the community whose role is very much to hold to account and scrutinise, that might be one way of doing it. Another way of doing it might be through scrutiny committees in local government. But I do think uh, there is perhaps scope to think of some uh, imaginative ways in which uh, community planning delivery uh, can and those delivering can be held to account for achieving what they set out to achieve. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think, I mean, I, I, in many ways, I think the questioning it, it stops there as far as I'm concerned. I've simply observed that we have two areas who clearly are able to defend what they're doing, you know, for better or worse, but I suspect uh, and suggest that the Auditor General's report implies that there are other areas where this is not so good, uh, but I can hardly expect those who are here at the moment to defend others who aren't. Okay, Colin Keir. Uh, thanks, uh, convener. I think some of my answers have, have been answered, um, uh, but the, there's a few things um, that still sit with me a little bit. Uh, in my looking at the, uh, the recommendation, the recommendations uh, on page six, uh, of what CPPs should do, and the first couple of uh, about strengthening the, the effectiveness of leadership challenge, scrutiny, etc. Some of it's been answered and streamlining the local working arrangements that comes in underneath. It kind of rem reminds me of a problem uh, in my days as a 
councillor uh, in Edinburgh, which was that uh, we set up underneath the CPP the neighbourhood partnership system, which um, sat around the various areas and with the partners. And I remember um, initially, at any rate, and I have to say that my knowledge of this is now about five years old, um, the difficulty that we actually had in some ways of getting partners um, clued up to how to take part in the in the, the management of this partnership. And it seemed to be, although that there was an awful lot of people sitting around talking about what they were doing, there wasn't there was a limited amount of integrated partnership that was actually happening on the ground. There were difficulties that we've seen on a number of occasions. I'm not just talking about the community partnerships problems but the the problems overall of integrated working in, as against working with, within silos. And I come to, the one question that's in the back of my mind is that we all know that there's a board of community planning partnerships, but do the people who work underneath the board level at council and local partner, uh, not on the board, but maybe medium, medium uh, area officers, interest officers, do they actually understand what the CPP is? Okay. What's the response to that? Councillor Parker? I, I can identify actually with some of that. I think certainly in the early days and when we had uh, an independent share and uh, our initial structures were quite cumbersome. Um, and I think we, we did create a kind of structural um, bureaucracy that, that some people found difficulty uh, with. Certainly, as I, as I said in a previous answer, we're, we're quite keen at reviewing what we do and, and self-evaluating the work we've done. And, and in recent times, we have changed our structure to streamline it and, and to make it more effective and to try and reduce the number of meetings people have to attend and to try and make sure that, you know, that, that we're, we're, we're pulling people in who have got the capacity to do the work that we're asking them to do. So I think our, our current structure is very different from the one that we set out with. It's certainly uh, much more streamlined. And I think um, in terms of officer colleagues in the council and across the partner, agencies who are involved in it, I think they're absolutely aware of what the board does now and they know what the, the different groups th th that do that are delivering the day-to-day -day work. So I think our current structure is a very good one, but, but certainly in the past I, I would accept that uh, possibly we hadn't gotten that right at the beginning. Yeah, members of the panel want to respond to that? Likewise, from an Aberdeen perspective, that, that basically reflects our position far leaner, and dare I say a bit more agile now, our structure that we're building on. The question I suppose that asked is, uh, do all our staff across the respective organisations, agencies, etc., need to know the finer detail of all that's been achieved or all that's been worked on by CPP? But I go back to my, the experiences within my organisation, and I know that's been played through now in the Council on Fire. It is having the understanding of that collective responsibility around about the 2022 the vision for Aberdeen City, how that plays through the single outcome agreement. And making it real for staff, I think, is the important thing and how that fits with their day-to-day -day priorities, their expectations and delivering a service to the public, whatever organisation they happen to be in. Okay. <coughs> Anybody else I'm, really, I'm really looking for the, the NHS um, here because... The NHS were actually one of the more problematical um, areas initially uh, uh, in getting involved in local partnerships and understanding. As I say, it was all, um, this is NHS work and this is what we're doing. And the, there was very little grey area over to other... Susan Webb point to come in an NHS point. Yeah, yeah I, I can do that. Um, I think I'd said earlier uh, in the evidence I gave that I think sometimes uh, staff on the ground very much work in partnership because they believe that will deliver better services for their patients or their, their clients. However, they perhaps don't associate that with community planning and, and the structures. Um, certainly from an NHS perspective, um, health and social care integration and integration integrated joint boards, I think as we move forward on that, we need to make sure that we're very clear of the role of the integrated joint board in community planning so that staff become aware of the contribution to both the board and then the community wider partnership. Um, and that will take us, I think, a bit of, of time to raise awareness of, of staff because that, that is, a, is a change. So, so can we really drill down to levels then of awareness then if we were to speak to a nurse in your 
organisation, would they be aware of the who the chair of the Community Planning Partnership was? Would they get, receive minutes of the Community Planning Partnership? Would they receive the objective, the strategic aims? What, what kind of information would they receive? Um, I, again, um, I think a, a, a nurse, I, I suppose it depends where you are in the organisation. Um, if it was a, a, a nurse based within Aberdeen City, um, I, they wouldn't necessarily be aware of the whole community planning structure, um, but they may be aware of some of the, the, the programmes that, that they're involved with. Um, I think this is an area we were discussing earlier about the need um, to make sure that we link our activities and badge them through community planning partnership, how to engage um, what the structures are, and we've got further work to, to do on that. But I don't think that that then translates into um, people aren't participating in activities. It, it's just they may not uh, recognise them as community planning activities. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, I'd probably accept the fact that somebody who is a, a nurse is probably not going to know, what, you know, she's right at the front end, isn't likely to know what the CPP is. But I would expect that anyone who's producing a strategic direction within any partner organisation to have at least an idea of where this came about, why it's being done, and why it's not an addition to the present bureaucracy, but should be a part of the bureaucracy um, that's there. It's not an addition. It should be real partnership working. Now, my concern, and it seems to come through in, in the background of much of what the Auditor General has come in and said, is the fact that we have the CPP, which virtually nobody, if you go out in the street, nobody will know what a CPP is. I'm absolutely certain of that, because I've actually asked, do you know what this is? They don't. It's they don't know. They either see it as being, this is the council, this is the NHS, this is police, whatever it is. They don't realise. One of the most successful things we've had in Edinburgh, actually, is the police um, partnership. It's been great. Well, I think it has been since we changed it. But to me, the difficulty actually happens when you get down into below director level, below the, that sort of strata of management, down to the people who are supposed to implement it but don't actually know why they're implementing it and where it comes through into the system. And I think this is the difficulty. I think Nigel Dawn was trying to pick up on that, that the actual structure of the, um, the development of service provision within the area needs to be clearer throughout every partnership organisation to say we're not on our own, we're doing this because. And this is, I think, where we end up with people who will sit there and say, we can't do that because we've always done it this way and etc. etc. We've all heard it. So what I'd like to know from uh, people here is how do you take that through to your individual organisations to explain to them this is why uh, we're doing this. This is why it's not an addition to the bureaucracy, but it's a merging of partnership working within our responsibilities, working together. How do you do this and explain it so the people who are middle management actually know what they're managing for? I, I think there's a challenge there for all of us, and I think if I was to ask staff uh, middle management level, tell me what the community planning partnership is about, I'd probably be met with a blank stare. Um, our staff, many of our staff, know about joint working and working in partnership because it's what they do. Uh, but they're probably not so aware of uh, uh, the strategic approach that the Community Planning Partnership is trying to, uh, uh, to, to, to grapple with. Um, I think also there's a question of how we might better link the work of uh, the partnership to our own in health, our own governance and management structures. Because, um, and it's a weakness at my end, that we, we, we do little more than uh, provide minutes of community planning partnership meetings, uh, when in fact we should be providing much more uh, explanatory information to encourage ideas to come forward from staff and so on. So I think there's quite a job to be done about selling the, 
the role of community planning partnerships and also the achievements because um, you know, we read the, uh, the transcript of the, uh, the debate in December and the impression is that next to nothing is happening when we know in the borders that it is. And we're probably uh, deficient in the way that we promote uh, the, the concept of community planning, the benefits uh, that, if we can get it right, the benefits that will accrue to Scottish borders people. So we need to do more internally and externally uh, to talk up and to talk about uh, the work of community planning. And then we we'll need to move on uh, to the next question. I, I promise I'll be brief yep. again. Just again from my perspective, Police Scotland within Aberdeen City, I've mentioned it before, it is that single outcome agreement. It's how it filters down into our day job, dare I say inverted commas, how that plays through with staff appraisals. You know, we are seeing perhaps relative terms fairly hierarchical. I try and be as organic as I possibly can with my resource in the city. There's a good fit there. We're encouraging through staff meetings with the inspectors, the chief inspectors, that's at middle management level. What does this actually mean for you? They don't need to know every word from every minute of community planning, but they need to know that community planning services, the city, the single outcome agreement, the priorities, the things that matter, and where can we play our part, not only in terms of community safety, but into the other five thematic groups. And my staff at a middle management level will have a reasonable enough understanding of that, because that will play through into their staff appraisals, because they have to feel it in a very positive sense as well, but their contribution will be through the partnerships, and the partnerships' objectives within their staff appraisals will reflect community safety partnership, which in turn, going back up, will reflect community planning. And that ought to play through to the teams as well. And we knowledge check, allow the, the phrase, but we do do that right down to the constable level. Where do you fit in all this? So I'm reasonably comfortable that we triangulate as much as we can, but it's still work in progress. But we're certainly going the right direction. I really just wanted to put this into context. Um, you know, the role of this committee is actually to scrutinise value for money and effective spend. And I think the whole morning we haven't really mentioned uh, the word money. But there's, uh, I heard on the radio this morning there's another committee looking at... Uh, Creative Scotland and Scottish Enterprise, who allegedly don't work together to the detriment of our film industry. We've also had the Christie Commission, which we all signed up to, which was about working together. Uh, we've been forced to bring in legislation uh, for health and social care integration in order to make them work together. And can I just say that uh, in, in my time on this committee, almost every report, maybe not everyone from the Auditor General, but high percentage, it's about people not working together or not sharing data. So why is it in a country of five and a quarter million, after 16 years of a Scottish Parliament having been reconvened, why are we sitting here for three hours this morning asking why our public services can't talk to each other? What, what is it about? Is it, well, I, I just don't understand that. Can someone explain that to me? I know you've got very good plans going forward, but to be fair, we heard very good plans going forward after the 10-year report card. And, you know, I'm, I just don't understand it. I mean, I've been 16 years here, and almost every committee I've ever been on, uh, including the health committee that put through the Health and uh, Social Care Act, but why do people in Scotland and public services not talk to each other? Why are we wasting, spending three hours today asking you why you can't work together? I'm going to ask one member of the panel to answer that because we've got another two questions and then we need to conclude. Who wants to answer that? Mr Rain. Uh, uh, yeah. Could I say, Convener, I think if that is uh, the impression that we've conveyed that the parties can't work together, then we've failed this morning because I did hope that we were getting across the message that we are, we, we're the living proof of uh, joint working, uh, working together, and we are good at data sharing, and that data sharing is producing some good outcomes. Um, so I, I'm somewhat disappointed to hear that uh, that's the impression we might have conveyed. Uh, and I, again, I can't speak for any wider part of Scotland than the borders, but I did hope to give you the message that we, we do speak to one another. David Parker and I travel up together even. So we, there's, a, there's a strong measure of cooperation across all of the partners on our uh, board. Can I just say, we didn't in the 
Scottish Borders submit uh, to the committee written evidence beforehand. But having been here this morning, and if you'll allow me, I will most definitely um, submit written evidence after this session on behalf of the partnership, uh, particularly in the area of joint working, because I think there is a story to tell that, uh, that we're obviously not conveying, but there is a significant amount of joint working uh, and, and, and work going on um, with other partner organisations. Um, it was touched upon earlier by uh, Councillor Parker regarding the, the previous uh, formation of the CPP with an independent chair. So uh, kind of going forward, um, the, the panellists think that uh, having an independent chair of the CPPs, as well as placing the CPPs on a statutory footing as per the Community Empowerment Bill, will actually make the CPPs more effective. What stands to that? I can certainly say Mr. something. We, we, we did go for an independent chair in the Scottish Borders in the early days, and that was really because um, there was quite a lot of turmoil and change going on within some of the partner organisations and, and the council. I wouldn't say we're at odds, but we were campaigning to keep certain services. Um, and it was quite difficult um, where, where I was going around at the time trying to fight to save the university uh, and, uh, and then having the, then to go to a community planning partnership with the university and try and be nice to them as well was always quite, quite a complex <laughs> argument. So in the early days, there were, there were political motivations why we felt an independent chair was a, a good idea. Um, and, and that worked OK. But I, I think we came to a conclusion that actually it didn't add a, a significant value. The independent chair found it quite frustrating as well. So we moved to a new arrangement, and that arrangement is that the CPP has been a formal committee of the council, and I have chaired it. We're currently going through an evaluation process of that arrangement just now, um, and, and we'll see where we get to with that. I, I personally am quite relaxed about it. I mean, I think things are working now uh, better than they have been. Um, but I would imagine what will come as a result of our reviews that there will be some kind of rotation of the chairman say or some of our arrangement put in place that the council aren't sharing all the time and I'm certainly very relaxed about that and, and would welcome that. Okay. And final question, Colin Beattie. Thank you. I've also got three very quick questions. The first one is I've heard some quite positive uh, statements being made on sharing resources, sharing services and so on in individual cases. Would that have happened anyway or did the, CP the existence of the CPP act as a facilitator for that? a bit of both. I think some of it may have happened anyway, but because of the CPP, I think the pace of it certainly in the borders has increased and I think um, because we're doing it so frequently now, when people are looking at designing new services, they're actually thinking about where the partners can add value and Mr Rain is at the moment looking at a new children's service at the Borders General Hospital uh, and I know in very early discussions about the council and other partners will be very heavily involved in that, it'll be a co-located facility and there'll be joint funding going into it from the partners. And if I turn to page 15 of the Auditor General's report, uh, the paragraph at the top of the page there states that the current pace and scale of activity is unlikely to deliver the radical change in design and delivery of public services called for by the Christie Commission. Do the panel have a view on that? Councillor Ling. Um, well, it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, I would, I would hope from what we've said today and the, the positive moves that we're making going forward that we will be able to pick up the pace, we will be able to deliver. Um, but it's, as I mentioned earlier, we have to wait and see what the outcomes are um, as we go forward. And we'll obviously have to be judged on that. Okay. Mr Watson. So I, you know, I echo the sentiment of Jenny there. I'm pretty bullish in the current structure and I'll be slightly subjective with the people around the table that will make significant progress in Aberdeen. But there is, back to that element, I think it was picked up on by Mr Don. it's the moving parts, people move on, and it's that sustainability, and it needs to be driven through all the, the, the business plans of respective organisations. Everybody under, needs to understand that this is the legitimate way about going about our business in the city, the borders, and the other 30 local authorities in the country, that it's right up there as that day business. Okay, uh, can I thank the panel for the time this morning? Uh, I think we've got one follow-up piece of correspondence which we, Councillor Parker's kindly agreed to, to send to us in terms of examples of good practice. So thank you uh, very much for your time and can I suspend the committee for five minutes to allow for the witness changeover. Thank you.
welcome our second panel of witnesses. I would like to welcome Sarah Davidson, uh, Director General of Communities of the Scottish Government, uh, Councillor David O'Neill, uh, President of COSLA, uh, and finally Pat Waters, the Chair of the National Community Planning Group. Uh, I understand that two members of the panel, uh, Sarah Davidson and Pat Waters, would like to make a brief uh, and make a brief opening statement. So can I start first of all with Pat Waters? I just open up, Chair, and say, um, can I say that uh, as far as the National Group is concerned, we are, we are actually um, very welcome of the report. Um, unlike what I've heard at the committee today, we don't think it's an entirely negative report. We think it's actually a very good report with a lot of positive aspects in it. And can I say that the, the reason that we have got scrutiny um, of the community planning is that community planning itself tried to insist and worked with Audit Scotland to get to a position where we could actually evaluate what we were doing as organisations on the ground. So, I mean, it's not anything that community planning, either under the 32 groups or at the national stage, wanted to hide what they were doing. We welcome the opportunity of scrutiny. And remember what scrutiny is about. It's about trying to help and assist to improve. It's not just about criticism. Sarah Davison. Thank you, Convener. I also wanted to start by welcoming the report. And uh, as uh, Pat Waters was just saying, the um, auditing of partnership activity this way is something of an innovation. And I'm really grateful to the Auditor General and the Accounts Commission for working together in a way which is designed to support improvement in community planning. I also wanted to be clear at the outset that the Scottish Government welcomes and accepts all the findings and recommendations in the report. I personally was involved in this area of work a few years ago, and coming back to it again after that period of time, I do recognise that renewed sense of energy and a more active participation that the report describes. Uh, and it, it's really good to see what the Auditor General described as the beacons of good practice being recognised. But we also recognise that there's a long way to go before community planning fulfils all the potential which those who signed up to the Statement of Ambition believes that it has. I really welcome the fact that the recommendations have been pitched in a, as um, constructive aids to improvement and the Scottish Government, COSLA Solace, working with the National Group, have already started to act on all the uh, recommendations in the report. I'm very happy to talk more about that this morning. OK. Thank you. Can I just, uh, first of all, uh, just open the first question and really it's responding to, and I think you've heard some of the frustrations about the timescales that have been involved in making improvements. Obviously, the legislation has been in place for some years now, since 2003, uh, and obviously we're still, uh, we're still referring to how we can make improvements and how we can take this forward. And is there any timescales attached to, to how we can implement some of the, the changes that have been recommended in the report? I, mean, I, I accept, Paul, that the, um, the legislation has been in place since, since 2003. Um, I think there was um, hints earlier on to about how that was, was approached by um, the, the public service at that particular point. Um, although the legislation was there, the only one that had the legal responsibility was local government. People could dip in if and when they wanted. I think the government recognised that, and hence there's new legislation coming through. I think the renewal of the statement of ambition has made it an absolute sea change to how we look at community planning, how we take it forward. Um, having, you know, like say the, the whole of the public sector signed up to that statement of ambition. And that is not an end in itself, um, but I think that has renewed how we take forward community planning and how we inject some energy into community planning at local level to ensure that, the, the, that what's happened is having added value and actually changing the outcomes for the local people. Although, haven't we? Yeah. We've been here before. I mean, I'd mean, I mean, probably there's been many committee meetings similar to this that have taken place where people have said, yeah, we can do this, we can take it forward. I mean, is it beyond repair? I mean, can we do something with coming well, I, I mean, can I well, say what, to What's you, different now from what's been proposed before? I think the, 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 the commitment and buy-in from the whole of the public sector now to deliver uh, is what's the changes. I mean, the statement of ambition, which I, I think in the last meeting of the national group, I've asked officers to look about how we reshape that and to drive it forward even further, to go back out to community planning and say, how do we want to take this forward? But there is many, many, many uh, good practices on the ground now at local communities because of community planning and partnership working that's going on at the present time that wouldn't have happened if, if community planning hadn't been there. Yes, it took a long time to get off the ground, Paul. Is there still work to be done? Yes, there's still work to be done. Can we improve? Yes, we can improve. 
but don't tell me it would have happened that it hadn't been there, because it wouldn't. So, can, can I just fast finally before I bring my colleagues in, can you give me three examples of that kind of good work that would, that's happening now as a result of community planning? No. Can I say to you, if I, if I, if I even just go to uh, something that's very close to your heart in Glasgow and look at how Glasgow is tackling that, I mean, Glasgow is tackling it in a very basic way, but a very practical way and actually making improvements in, in delivery. If I could look at what's happened in, 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 a, in, in one partnership in area in Glasgow alone, for instance, the, the work that's done by the Housing Association with police, with fire, with the City Council, and with voluntary organisations. In the past three and a half years in the, in the city housing stock, there has been one fire death in all that time. The, the housing association themselves believe that in the first two years of the project of partnership working, they saved £22 million as a result of not having to decant tenants and not having to refurbish property because of fires within the thing. And that's about prevention and early intervention. That's very practical ways of whether we can work together within the public sector to ensure that what we're only, not, not only we're delivering a change, but delivering an improvement to people's lives. During the first two years, we reckon, as a Fire and Rescue Service, for instance, that we'd have seen seven deaths a year in Glasgow. In the first two years, 14 deaths prevented the result of partnership working. Taking aside the financial benefits to the Housing Association and the Health Service and the, the, the public authorities. So that's practical examples of how we do that. You know, if I go to other areas, you know, like if I look at, you know, for instance, in, in East Renfrewshire, for Ed Renfrewshire, where I was just last week for a meeting with the council, when I walked through the door of their partnership office, I couldn't tell you, and neither could the public tell you, whether the member of staff dealing with me is either a council member of staff or a member of staff from the NHS. That would not have happened if it had been that partnership working and how we take things like that forward. And there's many examples. If I go to West Lothian and how their partnership has developed over the years, a shining example of how we can actually learn from each other and take areas forward. So there's many examples we can excite, we, we, can, we can say that actually ensures that what we're doing is delivering and making a difference to people's lives within local communities. Okay. Sarah, Sarah Davison. Just if it's helpful me to add another couple of examples to that, I thought it was very interesting what Councillor Parker said in evidence earlier about the CPP setting the context locally for good partnership working. In other words, the working doesn't all actually only have to take place at the community partnership level, but it can set that context. I used to sit as a, a non-executive member on both Dumfries and Galloway and Edinburgh Community Planning Partnerships. And there I saw very practical examples of the type of joining up we heard earlier, when issues which would previously not have been well understood by all the partners were discussed at the table, and that then enabled the partner organisations to bring their own resources to bear in addressing them. I heard that happen both in relation to demographics and into um, preparing young people in the area for skills to meet the challenges of the area. And then in Edinburgh, there was good working happening at local level, where I think some of the people who were in localities weren't necessarily confident that they had the support from their collective leadership for what they were doing and the community planning partnership was a place where that could be made very explicit and where the, the senior leaders could think about ways in which they could make sure that people who are delivering in the neighbourhood partnerships had all the backup and support they needed. Okay. Um, the previous panel highlighted a number of areas where they, had, they, they, they showed good practice in sharing of resources, sharing of services and so on. And when I asked them the question, would this have happened in any case, regardless of whether it was a CPP? The answer was a bit of both. What would, you, what would your comment on that be? Possibly that could have happened, yes. Um, I think, like say, in, in, in areas where there is uh, a real willingness to work together, that would have happened anyway. I think there's areas where it would not have happened. I mean, I, I think the, like, say the, the push for better partnership working um, has been there for a long, long time. The buy-in to get all the parties involved in that has not been. I think the community planning partnership, and particularly in the past two years, they've seen a vast improvement in how we take that forward. You know, I, so I would accept that some of it might have happened. The majority of it wouldn't have. Because people were still in very much in silos prior to this. I think what's significant about the community planning partnership is it is the one place that brings together formally all of the strategic leaders in an area responsible for services and that it does so along with the third sector as we've heard earlier and in many places also with local business. 
So whatever partnership working is happening between two or three other organisations, there is one place where decisions are taken about the strategic priorities for the whole area and decisions made about alignment of resources. And it wouldn't surprise me if there was a correlation between places where there's good partnership working happening anyway and really good effective leadership around that shared table. And I would think it probably always has to be a bit of both, um, as we heard earlier. Just taking that a step further, I mean, one of the key areas that the CPB can make an impact is on alignment of budgets, shifting of resources into more uh, preventative activity. And the indications are that's not really happening. Now, obviously, the CPP doesn't actually have a budget and doesn't have direct control of anybody's budget. But I would have thought that the CPP role in influencing the, quite simply, the alignment of budgets towards the, the outcomes that everybody wants, it's not happening. I'm not sure that's, that's the case. I mean, uh, public agencies are now obliged to share their budget information with each other. So the local authority will share with the health board, the health board will share with others, so that we are all aware, and that gives us a better opportunity to align uh, what we're actually doing. I think, just going back a wee bit, it would be fair to say anyone who was involved with community planning at the beginning, uh, all those years ago, and coming into it today, we'll find it's a vastly different beast. It's, it's changed dramatically in, in that time. I think it would be fair to say when community planning was initially established, there wasn't really an understanding of what it was. Some folks thought it was a geographic community. Some folks thought it was a, uh, a community of service delivery organisations. In actual fact, it's about both and about much more. And I think that recognition is now there. And it's about delivering for, it, for our communities. So I think in the last, uh, about the last two or three years, we have seen community planning take up a, a, a new role, get a bit of pace. And I'm fairly confident, uh, I'm conscious that I might get invited back here next year and, and get built up for saying this, but I'm confident that we will start to see uh, the pace of change in, increase. I mean, I welcome the optimism, but I'm looking at the Auditor General's report of November 2014 and the Auditor General's report of March 2013, and they both tell a fairly negative story. Uh, and there seems to be a lot of concerns, and one of the key areas is that this shifting of resources is not taking place. And let's face it, everything follows money these days. Didn't they ask the Auditor General to go and write a report that we would like? We asked them to go and look at what, what they saw and tell us what they saw. That informs us, it gives us, uh, uh, helps the decision-making process and it allows us to take the right decisions to move it forward. The report is a fair report. It's got good bits in it as well, though. I, I mean, quite, quite a few people sitting round about the table today have been picking parts of the, of the report I don't particularly want to do an awful lot of that. Key messages, since the publication of the Statement of Ambition, there's a strong sense of renewed energy nationally and locally to improve in community planning. Community planning continues to become more of a shared enterprise with more active participation by partners and evidence of more shared ownership of the priorities in single outcome agreements. And as you get through the report, there's many other positive aspects. Fully accept that there's negative aspects as well. We asked for a report that was what's and all. That's what we got. But if, I, if we again look at the Auditor General's report, it states there that the pace and scale of current activity is unlikely to deliver the radical change called for by the Christie Commission. Would the then that, that's a, a strong message from the Auditor that we need to up the pace of change. I mean, Accepted. I mean, we've had 10 years. How many more years before, we, before a CPP is fully effective? CPPs will continue to evolve uh, continuously. It's not something that, that's ever going to be fixed, that will never be, be job done. Uh, could I maybe pose a question? If it's not going to be community planning, what is it going to be? Is it going to be a whole-scale reorganisation of public services in the near future? don't really think so. Let's make community planning work. Coming back to, the, to a very simple... Okay. Coming back to a very simple uh, function that the CPP should be carrying out is encouraging and, and, and hopefully guiding and agreeing the shifting of resources towards preventative activity, aligning budgets, and that's not happening. Can I say that? I mean, 
I think when we, we first envisaged community planning, what we were looking about was everybody would put their budget on the table and we would discuss what the priorities were and how we would allocate that budget to those priorities. No practical. Can't be done. Health has still got to deliver health in Scotland, and their budget is probably dictated to that. Local authorities still have to deliver education, and they've got budgets dedicated to that. What the community planning has done, and I used a very early example of in Glasgow, was to see what is the priorities. Can we get a jointly agreed priorities where they kept it extremely simple in how they took that forward? They set the priorities in Glasgow, and then the community planning partners round the table agreed that that was the priorities, and would then look about how their input to deliver the priorities. You know, would, would, would outcome. Whether it was working together jointly or, or whether it was something that they were doing as an individual organisation with support of others. So it's not just about aligning budgets, it's about setting agreed priorities and looking about how you would deliver that. I mean, the, the point that we have, we have raised about early intervention and prevention, we have asked the national group for, for local community planning partners to identify where they are actually doing that work and shows evidence that that is happening. And that is happening at the present time, where they're beginning to show evidence about how they're putting it. But some of the changes we're talking about, as you heard earlier on, are generational changes. It's not going to be changes that you're going to see next week. You may not even see it next year. If you're talking about influencing you know, the life of people into the future, you're talking about a generational change. To tackle the, equality, the inequalities that are there, for instance, in health, you will not see a change next week or next year, or maybe even 10 years. You will see a generational change of how that will impact in communities and the lives of people who live in those communities. So we can't see an overnight change in what's happened. What we need to do is take those first steps to ensure that we start that work and see that in the future we will see a change to the impact in people's lives and how to live within that community. Yeah, Tavish Scott. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Audit Scotland observed that community planning partnerships are not clear about what their specific, specific role in public service reform is. Why is that? I say, I mean, I, I, as a chair of the National Community Planning Group, uh, I don't think it was nine months ago that I, I wrote out to every uh, chair of the community planning partners. I think community planning partners should be very clear about what their, what their objectives are, what their uh, aim is, and how they should be able to go about delivering that. I don't accept that. The community planning partners at that level don't know what their, what their goal is. Scotland found that, Mr Waters, because we know about your letter of July of last year, and we've also got um, Audit Scotland's advice on that, that they're not clear as to what difference that letter's made. So I repeat the question. Why don't, look, why don't CPPs, Audit Scotland's saying it's not me, why do CPPs not know what their role in, in public service reform, major public service reform is? I'm sorry, Tavish, but I can't answer why they don't know, because it's very clear to me what the, what the aims and objective is, and I've tried to actually put that across to community planning partners. I mean, many of whom I know personally, and I know that they know what the ends and ambitions are. Well, let me try it the other way around. Um, is integrating health and social care the number one priority for community planning partnerships? No, it's the number one aim for, for, for certainly government. But it's the, biggest, not, it's the biggest reform going uh, on in, in, uh, across but all can I say, of our it, it, does not, it does not diminish the role of community planning partners. As a matter of fact, it sits very much alongside community, community planning partners and how they could change and deliver for their community. It is not a hindrance. I wasn't suggesting it was a hindrance. I'm just suggesting, as David Parker said in evidence earlier on, that when that comes into the front page of his inbox, then everything else gets pushed down. Would you accept that? No, I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think it's, in a, in, it's, it's something that works alongside what's happening in community planning partners. I don't think it overrides what's happening in community planning partners, but it is a need to, to deliver an unchanging economy. community. But I thought David Parker was being very fair, because what he was pointing out is that um, when another national initiative happens, and this is the biggest one, apart from police reform, this is the biggest one imaginable, huge, huge role uh, and requirements placed on both local government and on the NHS, then by definition, local priorities... You know, you can't do everything. Like David Parker said it very clearly. We ask the public sector to do too much at the moment, and we've, we've put in place a very big reform, and, you know, other things have to go, don't they? They have to slide down the inbox. They can't be done at the same time. I, th I think we have to appreciate that health and social care integration is not something that just happened overnight either. I mean, the pilots... Uh, there were five pilots in place that get set up seven, eight years ago. Uh -huh. So they were running for about five years before we started to get through the process of rolling it out uh, throughout Scotland. 
David's absolutely right. As a leader of a council, there will always be things that will land in your inbox, things that will land in your desk that, that you have to deal with straight away. Uh, his point was uh, perhaps uh, we could do a, a bit of a breathing space to allow us to get some of these things developed. I think that was a very well-made made point. Yeah. Uh, let's get these things right and then let's start new initiatives after that. So you'd, you'd, you'd look to what from national government in terms of allowing community planning partnerships to develop and make sure they can meet the criticisms found in the Audit Scotland report? What do you need to make sure that we're not here in another year's time and you're giving the same evidence uh, again? Uh, what? Bring Sarah Davidson in at this point and then I'll bring you back in. It was, it was really the specific point about health and uh, social care integration, uh, which I would expect to be very high up on the agendas, if not at the top of the agenda, for both the Health Board and the local authority participant in community planning in an area. And different community planning partnerships will have engaged with that differently. But what I would expect community planning partnerships to be most focused on as the entity is how will they, from the coming spring, involve that new statutory partner around the table of community planning and how will they make sure that they take all the opportunities they get to learn from what's going to be an embedded opportunity uh, sorry an embedded example of effective partnership working within a partnership context so i think there's a distinction to be made between things which are priorities for the constituent partners within community planning and things which are a priority for the actual partnership itself and those are not necessarily always one and the same mm. Can I, the final question I was going to have, if I may convene it, is that, again, Audit Scotland have observed that there is no coherent national framework for assessing the performance and pace of improvements of community planning partnerships. I wonder if you'd care to comment on that. That, we recognise that as well, and at the last meeting of the National Community Planning Group, when the group was discussing the Auditor General's report, uh, the group asked for advice from the senior officers group about how we could make further progress towards that, and that would be supported by the work that's been going on for some time on benchmarking across CPPs, uh, which is going to be shared with CPPs this coming spring and uh, will be developed over the coming year. So that, that's a criticism that we absolutely recognise and which the national group is keen that we address. So in other words, we can all do assertion in life, but we don't actually know how to m monitor the effectiveness of CPPs? There is, there is monitoring of effectiveness of individual activities, but there is a gap about the, how that adds up collectively and how individual CPPs so can compare audit, against each other. from an audit committee's point of view, we, don't have, we can't measure, can we? We can't measure at the moment. Not as much as so you would when, want to know. If I may ask, Sarah, when are we going to be able to measure? When well, as I say, the, the benchmarking framework will be shared with CPPs this spring, and that will be populated by data over the coming year. So by the time that the committee is looking at this again, there should be data to... To share about but forgive me, when will that be? Will that be by December of this year, next year? When? Uh, the expectation is to be starting benchmarking from the spring, so a full year's data would be ready in uh, spring 2016. 16 at the earliest mm -hmm. before. So, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, Colin Keir. Yeah, in terms of... Um, I'm sorry, just to... I haven't been sort of thinking my feet a little bit since <laughs> some things have been said I had uh, marked down, but in terms of the... Uh, the central position that you guys are coming from. Um, do you feel that the information that's going out to community partnerships and the various partners individually allows them to understand the clear way forward that you envisage it as a, a, a national set of uh, people implementing, so to speak? Do you feel that it's, it's clear? Because I was trying to sort of get the information from, in my questioning earlier, that the knowledge of CPPs from... Actually, if you go to some councillors, they're not clear what CPPs actually are. I know that because I used to be one, you know. <laughs> so, um, but the, the thing is, 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 is the information that's coming from Central heading out to these people, is it clear enough? It gives them enough leeway to deal with their local problems while dealing with national initiatives. But are we getting into this uh, situation where it's now become rather grey and everybody's starting to do their own things and people, they, uh, the, the expectations are perhaps raised to a point that they haven't been met, obviously, and we have situations, as various members have mentioned, about how do you actually audit the success of this particular setup? Is there anything else that, we, that you as a group can do 
government as well as uh, um, COSLA and uh, Pat, your group, uh, in, in your position, actually can do to make it a little bit simpler that people actually understand what the CPP is and what it's meant to do. Because there is obviously a thing about, um, as was pointed out by one councillor um, to me, who will remain nameless uh, today, but um, there is a fear among some that, um, that this may start digging into the democratic rights of councillors, for instance, to make decisions at council level. Can I, can I say to you, I mean, maybe if, if I could start off, and, and I'll, I'll, try and be, I'll try and be as brief as possible. Um, one, I don't think the, 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 the national group is, uh, is there to um, tell or dictate to um, CPPs. They are, you know, they have got democratically elected and accountable to their own area, you know, like say for, for, for the elected members on it, and others there are accountable elsewhere. Um, can the, uh, the the central group be more clear in how they, they deal with the advice going out? Yes, they can. Um, I think that, like I say, we're at, again, at the last meeting, um, I indicated that what we were going to look at was to, to reshape um, the national group. The national group is, is something like 22, and it has the leaders of the whole of the, uh, the public sector on. Um, if you remember, what, the, what we're doing is we're having discussions there. That is then taken back by those people that are delegated to be there to their own organisations to then you know, filter down the discussions that we've had within the, the, the community planning, the National Community Planning Group. But I'm conscious that in a group of 22 is extremely difficult to get to conclusions at that particular point. So we've decided we're going to have a smaller group that is going to look at how we, we drive forward the community planning in the future, and that will then report back to that bigger, that, that, that larger group. That smaller group will include, you know, ministers, you know, um, local government representatives and representatives of the health board, and from the um, the uh, voluntary sector. So we are, we are trying to reshape and how and, and to maybe get better at how we get the information out. But remember, the people around that table are there delegated from their organisations to feed back the information that they discuss at that national table. I, I, I think you make a very fair point. And one of the things that I have been reflecting on and preparing today and going back and looking at the guidance and uh, various exhortations that have been developed over the years is that we're often very good at describing things and writing them. And there's an exhibit in the report which very beautifully draws what it's meant to be like. And I think it's always really important that we who are at the centre understand how that uh, lands in local places. And one of the great benefits that government has had through the system of location directors, where we've had a senior member of staff attached to each, location, uh, each community planning partnership, is that we get that feedback about what actually happens when this guidance sits on the table. And when partners look at it, does it make the same sense there that it makes when it has left government and, uh, and COSLA? And part of the evolution which has been described, I think, has been of us recognising that it is very, very important to be very clear. And uh, I hope that one of the benefits that will come from the, from the Community Empowerment Bill will be uh, giving added point to what it is um, that community planning partnerships are supposed to do. And the, uh, the guidance which has come out and the letters which have come out from the national group in the last year or so have sought to do that as well. You also posed the question, is this damaging democratic accountability? Uh, do people see uh, some of the power disappearing? Well, inevitably, if you're going to have shared priorities, that criticism could be there. But it's better having a shared priority than having a local authority priority, a health service priority, an enterprise network priority. Let's get the priorities agreed and work together. It does have an impact on democratic accountability, but it's still a better outcome for the communities. You did say that you thought this was a fair report, and I think, uh, Ms Davidson, you also said that you accepted all the recommendations. In actual fact, um, you know, it is critical, but it's actually very critical of the tasks of the three of you in front of us today, rather than at the local level. Uh, and if I can just give an example, Scottish Government needs to demonstrate a more systematic approach to implementing outcomes. CPP is still not clear about what they're expected to achieve. That has to come from you. CPPs don't yet know what a strategic approach to prevention looks like. 
that has to come from you. And as Tavish Scott mentioned, and it's good, it's worth repeating, uh, there's no coherent national framework for assessing the performance and pace of improvements of CPPs. That has to come from you. And finally, convener, Scottish Government guidance is not clear enough about the specific role that CPPs should play in the implementation of public service reforms. So whilst we've had you know, a very good evidence session from Borders and uh, Aberdeen. And it does seem they've made some progress and their plans are, are positive uh, going forward. Uh, the report, and I'm only reading from page four and five, the summary messages, I'm not picking out paragraph 57, you know, a little phrase there. These are the key messages. And the key messages are that you have not stepped up to the mark to provide leadership, advice, support, coordination and teamwork that is required to make community planning a success. And that was the case 10 years after the legislation. And in the follow-up report, this is only two months ago, and you all, expect, you all accept that it's true and it's fair. Do you accept that you really haven't, you've taken the eye off the ball, you have not stepped up to the mark to give local CPPs the support they need? No. Well, can you explain they don't know what a strategic approach to prevention, the government guidance isn't clear, CPPs don't know what they're expected to achieve? Can, can I say you, you have been very selective in what you're picking for the report. Let me be equally selective. Sorry, could you just clarify my Six point? paragraphs. To, 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 be yeah. fair, to be fair to Mary Scanlon, she's asking questions that are in the report. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so can you respond to them? I'll give you an opportunity to elaborate on other points on it, but on those specific points, Key I would ask all members of the panel to respond to them. I'll start with Sarah Davidson. One of the things which I think has been a hallmark of the way in which those national bodies that you described have worked together since the Statement of Ambition and um, through the implementation of the new SOAs in the last 18 months to two years has been by adopting a very supportive approach to CPPs. So we worked very closely with CPPs as they developed their SOAs. There was a scrutiny and improvement uh, panel that did quality assurance, working very closely with each uh, community planning partnership up to the point when their SOAs were signed off. And each community planning partnership now has in place um, an improvement plan. And that uh, is something which they're also giving feedback about progress against to national group uh, through its senior officers group. Now, that, that is not to say that more couldn't be done, but I wouldn't want uh, the committee inadvertently to get the impression that we hadn't been working together very closely and with a shared ambition in relation to this. Uh, government, as I said at the outset, recognises the, the work that there still requires to be done and the criticisms that are made. Um, in, in relation to the specifics that you uh, identified, I already spoke about the benchmarking work. Um, in terms of the more systematic approach to outcomes, um, we recognise that there are places where some of the uh, local performance management arrangements and shared uh, partnership performance management arrangement are not as neat a fit as they ought to be and as we would like them to be in order to drive outcomes. And there's some work which has been going on for a while and uh, hopefully will come to fruition soon between um, the Improvement Service, the Local Authority Chief Executives Organisation and the Scottish Government to look at the overall performance management of uh, both the individual entities and uh, CPPs and the way those fit together. And then finally, the point about the role of uh, community planning partnerships in public service reform programmes. Um, we accept the feedback from CPPs that they have not always been as clear as they ought to have been or as they would have liked to have been about the way they fit. And uh, we'll certainly think about that and make sure that when the Scottish Government is speaking about public service reform, whether that affects one organisation or the way in which they come together, that we are scrupulously careful to enunciate the role of community planning partnerships. Uh, but I think the evidence also shows that even if community planning partnerships are not always identifying something as part of public service reform, they have been very involved in thinking about, for example, the role of uh, Police Scotland in their new shape and in playing into community planning partnerships. We've already spoken about health and social care integration and uh, the extent to which that will become a very important part of partnerships in the future. And uh, prevention is one of the priorities identified by the national group and we are thinking very carefully um, in discussion with CPPs about what support they would like from the improvement service, from us and from others, in order to make that uh, turn from something that's theoretical into something that's very real in terms of how they make decisions about local priorities. Well, can I say that? I, mean, uh, I, I find it difficult to... Um 
to say that, uh, that the national group is not accepted of the mark because I don't believe that's the case. Um, can we do better? Yes, Mary, we can. Um, I've tried to describe how we are going to um, reshape the organisation to actually ensure that we get this message out properly. Um, we're going to look at the statement of ambition um, to ensure that, that it's still relevant to what we're actually trying to achieve with, through, through national community planning. Do I need the message it actually gets out? I believe it actually does. Um, the, as I, I tried to explain, the national community planning group is made up of very senior people within the public sector whose responsibility being there is to take that message back to their organisation. Is that happening? Yes, it is. Is it happening as well as it should? Probably not, um, from, from what's been said. But can I say that uh, we accept this report, we accept the criticism in this report, and we'll, we'll strive to do better as a result of that criticism. Can I say that the way to actually help is to say, how can we assist the organisations to actually do better, not to continually criticise them? but to assist and help. Commissioner O'Neill. Again, selective reading from the report. Uh, the Scottish Government and the National Community Planning Group have taken steps to promote the importance of community planning across government and in partner organisations. The National Community Planning Group is now starting to focus its activity on the areas where national leadership is most needed. So there are many positives within the report. We accept the negatives and the positives. Well, if I could just uh, come back on one point, and uh, Sarah Davidson, you mentioned prevention. You were the only one that mentioned prevention, and it is a huge part of the government agenda. If I may say, probably all the opposition's agenda. We all want to look at, look at prevention, but the CPPs don't know what a strategic approach to prevention looks like. And you said that you're talking with CPPs, and you know you're thinking about it. Do you know what a prevention, a strategic approach to prevention looks like? So that, you know, is, is the strategic approach to prevention coming from government through yourselves to the CPPs? Is there a strategic approach? And if there is, why don't CPPs know what it looks like? I think one of the issues may be here about the language that's used and the extent to which CPPs always badge what they're doing prevention. Um, I think that some of the work which has been done across Scotland, for example, in relation to the Early Years Collaborative, which was spoken about earlier, is an example of investing in early years in order to prevent significant problems happening later on. And that is happening. That has got the active participation of all uh, community planning partners across Scotland. But, uh Paragraph 6 in the summary, uh, the Early Years Collaborative remains underdeveloped, so perhaps not the best example to use. It's, it's at an early stage, and you know, I, I agree we, sh we shouldn't ask these examples to bear more weight than they're capable of doing at the moment, but it is a, it is a good example of a, a focused attention across public services on an issue which everybody understands in terms of its importance for costs to the public service and more importantly outcomes for people later in life. So we are, you know, we shouldn't pretend that we've made more progress than we have but there is a discussion happening which is both strategic and also practical at local level in terms of prevention and I've also seen good examples again when I was on the Community Planning Partnership in Edinburgh talking about particular areas and neighbourhoods of Edinburgh where there were deeply ingrained problems which no individual service was capable of solving and people talking to together about how if they aligned their activities and aligned their resources they could make a difference and to me that is a strategic approach to prevention whether they would have called it that or not and uh, we heard earlier about uh, the importance of good practice and I see that as one of the core roles for both Scottish Government but also the national group that we do learn from where things are happening that we support people in being effective in them and that we share those examples so that they can be picked up more widely and if if there is more that we can do to help people to understand why some of these work and why some of them don't, then we'd be very keen to do that. I don't have any other questions, Convener, but I think it's very important to point out this is all that we've got. You know, I haven't brought anything else to the table other than what's in here today. So uh, I would be failing in my duty and responsibilities if I didn't hold you to account for what's in this report. Just clarify before I bring Nigel Dawn in that the committee's role today is to take evidence and we're taking evidence based on the information that's received to us. So if it sounds like criticism, uh, please be assured that it's an evidence session uh, this morning. Uh, Nigel Dawn. Thank you very much, uh, Convener, and, and good morning, colleagues, by a few seconds. Um, 
Uh, there are two issues I'd like to look at. The first is to pick up on the issue that was, was mentioned earlier about the health budget uh, addressing health issues. I would only have to go back to the debate in the chamber yesterday afternoon for a recognition in some places that it's not the health budget that's going to solve our health problems. Those are inbuilt within our communities and into children almost before they're born. And yet, I also heard this morning, as you did, because you were here, thankfully, uh, um, NHS saying, frankly, we're keeping our budget um, and it's not going anywhere else. And also recognising that NHS budgets are 99 point something percent, percent spent dealing with an illness response rather than on health and health illness prevention. Now, if the NHS is going to hold on to its budget, it's not going to share it, and there's clearly no expectation that community partnerships will get shared budgets. That's another thing that this morning I think quite clearly brought out. If the NHS is quite clearly going to remain as an illness response, how on earth are community planning partnerships, or for that matter any other part of our public service, actually going to get us <coughs> towards being healthier? The, I mean, I think it is about the um, prevention part of the agenda. I mean, I can understand the, the attitude of health. I mean, as a previous elected member, I would just, used to always argue that, you know, that the health service was the ill health service. The health service was actually the local government, you know, because that was our job was to try and improve and prevent um, in situations. But working together um, makes a, a vast difference to, to communities and how we generate that. I mean, there is... And if you, if you go to elderly, for instance, you go to elderly, for instance, we all know who the vulnerable elderly are, and that trips, spills, and slips um, cause problems. That the early, and early, uh, you know, people going into hospital when they actually don't need to get to hospital, and that was the, a discussion that I heard um, Shona Robertson making yesterday. Um, we've known that for a long, long time, but we don't work together to actually prevent it. And I'm not just talking about um, parts of the parts of local government, but parts of the of the rest of the public sector can work with local government to ensure that those vulnerable elderly are actually aware, so we know where they, so that you know we know where they are, and the steps can be taken to actually assist them in doing that. That impacts on the health budget and releases releases money within the health budget to then concentrate on prevention. You know, so it's... Respect, I'm, I'm, I'm with your logic, but it's not what's happening. Um, and I'm not suggesting that local authorities aren't doing what they can for the vulnerable. But I'm, uh, just to pick up on that issue, local authorities like the Health Board will tell you their core activities. And their core activities, as I won't need any, to tell anybody here, finish up being social work and education. Usually the budget's the other way around. And everything else is, is struggling in current budgeting environments. And that isn't going to change. But you then, Mr Waters, said, well, that releases money within the health service for health prevention. Mm. But it doesn't. Mm. Actually, it doesn't. And what we've got is a situation, I would suggest, where community health, sorry, community planning partnerships, because that is what we're talking about, are trying to get resources from here and there. But the principal place where they might get resources from, which is the NHS, is not going to give them the resources for health improvement. It's going to carry on doing its illness stuff. Can I say... I, I take that point uh, very much. Uh, the difficult part in reinventing services, redesigning services, isn't so much about agreeing that you need to invest in early intervention, it's what you disinvest in to fund that early intervention. That, that is a, a difficulty. It's trying to get a square peg into to a round hole. Uh, the body politic, the media are particularly uh, vocal whenever any public service tries to disinvest something, be it a hospital, uh, amalgamating schools, anything of that nature. You know, you get a few when when that happens. We need to have a slightly more mature attitude to disinvestment. Could I then follow that to the... To, I, I absolutely have to agree with you there, and I speak as a former councillor as, as, as well in, in the context. Is there any appraisal system of those who are in public service in the very senior appointments that we're talking about in CPPs that says not are you just delivering your core service, but are you actually working across the agendas? I'm picking this up partly because paragraph 23 says, and I quote, partners' formal lines of accountability are not to the CPP board, but to their own organisation's board. 
Therefore, their responsibility and their annual appraisal is on the basis of the core functions of, for example, the NHS or the Council. And that is precisely excluding what you want community planning partnerships to do and almost institutionalises a failure to do this cross-functional working, which will enable us to do some prevention of all the things I've just spoken about. Can I maybe comment on behalf of uh, the appraisal for public bodies and, uh, and health boards, and, and, and colleagues might want to answer for local government. Um, what you say is, is, is absolutely right, and uh, one, an important part of understanding how to make this work is understanding people's you know, intrinsic motivations as well as their extrinsic ones, and, and clearly the appraisal process and the holding to account of, is very important in that. And uh, one of the things which, over the last couple of years, government has been trying to do better is to make it very clear what we expect of the bodies who are accountable to government to do in relation to this. So, for example, sponsor teams in the Scottish Government, uh, as part of the appraisal process of public bodies with whom they have relationships, um, should be looking closely at their contribution to community planning as well as their delivery of their individual specific functions. And uh, we're just about to give the next round of guidance to public bodies on that, which I hope will make that even clearer. Are we doing that as well as we could yet? No, probably not, uh, but we have to go on getting better at it. And similarly, as we heard earlier, um, the, clearly uh, the uh, police representative from Aberdeen was talking about embedding that in the police appraisal system and the police are probably better at that than some of the rest of us are and uh, health boards will increasingly be required to do that and I hope that the joint um, the, the new joint boards will be a focus for that activity as well and I think it's very important that we look right across the whole spectrum of motivations and accountabilities and do hold not only elected boards or appointed boards but also people whose jobs it is to do this to account for that activity. Uh, no, not really. <laughs> I, I, I think that, that, that we're in a, in a position where we are seeing a, a step change in how we take these things forward. I think we very much recognise that the report that came forward from, uh, from the auditor, what we're doing here today in the evidence gathering session is all part of the process of uh, checking, uh, making sure that the, the process is doing what it's meant to do, part of the checks and, and balances, part of being held, held to account. Uh, and there is a definite recognition that while uh, we are in a better place than we were, we are not in as good a place as we need to be. And this will be an ongoing process. Yeah. Could, could I just mm -hmm. ob observe, convener, um, given the structure of local government, you're going to find it difficult to hold chief executives to account for doing very much more than giving you a balanced budget. But I, uh, the practical realities of politics may well leave you struggling to, to, to force chief executives to really to, to engage with this, though I'm sure they will. I have much more interest in hearing Sarah Davidson say that uh, the NHS is going to more move towards being appraised on this because, as I say, what we heard this morning was very clearly my budget's my budget to do what I have to do with my core activities and I'm keeping it. Uh, that's not quite the words that are on the official report, but that's certainly what I heard. And unless the NHS is actually going to engage with that wider task of improving uh, a whole of our community life, then I think community planning partnerships are going to struggle of uh, guidance that went to health boards on their local delivery plans is, is absolutely explicit about the contribution of resources to community planning and it would therefore be my you know, lively hope and expectation that at the end of this round of, of activity they would be held to account by the Cabinet Secretary for Health and by the Director General for Health for exactly that. That sounds excellent. Can, just Can you just share just one point uh, and I'm going to bring in Drishma. Just to add to that, I mean, um, on the national group there is um, um, four chief executives of, of health boards, um, all of who are bought into to that organisation. Um, I've also had, although I've not had the opportunity, shown I could make the last meeting, uh, or it might have just been before, I think it was after the change, um, but that Shona Robertson couldn't make the last meeting, but the, certainly the last three um, health secretaries have been, have been bought very firmly into ensuring that there was that kind of buy-in um, from um, health boards and from people involved in that. So, I mean, I, I couldn't fault um, the government's um, drive or health drive to actually fully participate in it. Is it difficult? Yes, it's difficult when you're talking about their budget and how they try to determine their budget. But it's not all, when we're talking about resources, it's not all just about money. 
You're talking about other resources as well, whether it is people, whether it's buildings, whether it's other, other kind of support that you can give. So the whole package is there. And it's not just about aligning your budget, but aligning your resources, which sometimes mean your people, your facilities and other parts of the, the organisation that you're involved in. Okay. Smith. Um, when police counters were closing in, in my area, I got a letter from Police Scotland to tell me about it. And when um, changes have been made to, to daycare services in Glasgow City, I got a letter from the City Council to tell me um, that they're disinvesting from that service. And um, when the Health Board withdraws funding from a, a local voluntary sector, you normally don't get a letter from the Health Board, you get it from the, the voluntary sector organisation. The Health Board really warn you in advance of these things. But the point is, the, the, these are all these organisations, and I think. This is what I was interested in what David O'Neill said about this, is that a lot of the disinvestment decisions are taken by individual organisations and community planning is doing the bit of thinking about where you would want to invest and where you would innovate. And I wonder if you can maybe give a perspective on how much um, that is a problem, because if you're not having the, the correct balance of the discussion between disinvest and invest, then the community planning structures are fairly hamstrung by uh, the fact that the, the other organisations will take their disinvestment decisions in isolation. Um, and they'll be subject to all the usual um, political pressures of, of making difficult choices. So, well, an example of that would be uh, a report that came out fairly recently, I think it was called Town Centres First, where uh, be it local authority, health service, police, whoever, uh, if you are closing offices, closing counters, you know, What's the economic impact that's going to have in a, a town centre? You, you, you might find, let's just say it was a local authority office that, that gets closed and you relocate into another building. There might be a saving for the local authority, but you could be damaging the town centre. So in the long run, the, the, the impact could be negative rather than, than positive. And it's that type of thinking that you need to have across the, the the, the public services, not only how is this going to impact in our budget, but how is it going to impact on the public budget? How is it going to impact on the, the entire public spending? How is it going to impact in, on communities? So we do need to be a bit smarter than that uh, and stop just uh, looking at the, at, at the bottom line and think about the wider impact. There's an interesting issue there as well about the culture and the holding to account within partnerships, which you've heard a bit about earlier and which I know the report talks about. The um, Committee Empowerment Bill is very clear about how it expects committee planning partnerships to work in the future and that you know, each committee planning partnership would identify the priority local outcomes for their area and what each of them was going to do to support that. And I would hope that in a context where that's all been agreed round the table, if one partner saw one of the others disinvesting in something which they believed to be fundamental to achieving those shared outcomes, they would have the, both the relationship and the trust and the confidence to challenge that within the partnership. And one of the things which I think the report is saying is that the, that culture is not yet as fully developed as it ought to be. And you know, I think we all recognise that's potentially quite uncomfortable space where you've got a mix of people coming from different organisations, but it's clearly where we need to get so that people do understand why decisions are being made, but also are confident in challenging them if they don't seem to fit. See, on this, I mean, this kind of comes up perennially when you, when you discuss partnership um, uh, relationships in the public services. Um, and we, talk, well, we talked about it at some length in the, the earlier panel, but um, the extent to which this is all, or appears to be, um, dependent upon relationships and culture and um, you know, these fairly intangible things um, and the frustration that that causes for all of us to, if you know, we want to see this, the, the whole process uh, be a success and move forward, forward quicker. Um, have you got any perspectives on what is the appropriate balance between partnership and leadership? Um, and if, the, if certainly the Auditor General is, is, seems to be pointing to a, a deficiency around um, leadership, then where is the accountability over that leadership? <coughs> I, I, if I could miss that, I know that David's want to come in. I mean, I, I think there are examples where um, relationship damage that partnership. Um, and there's also examples where relationships be set aside to ensure that the partnership works and works properly. I mean, can I, can I assure you that, I mean, if you looked at, um, at Glasgow, which I mentioned earlier on, who is a shiny example, by the way, about how to drive this forward. If you look at the relationship between Glasgow and, and, and the health board, not three years ago, 
They were like family at war. They are working together, whether that relationship has been mended or not, but they are working together as an example of how partnership, and, and it's been driven by the leadership of both of those organisations to ensure that that partnership is, is working. Are they still holding hands and skipping up and down, down Siggy Hall Street? I don't know. No. But it's working. And it's working because the leadership is insisting that the partnership is more important than any, uh, you know, bit that's the, the, that was at fall. You know, so I think that, like I said, it, it can work both ways. You know, like I say, I think leadership has to drive it and ensure that that partnership is going to be successful. But that partnership can be successful even if the relationship's not right, as long as there, there, is, a, there is a driver to ensure that it's going to happen. You know, I'm sure that the relationship between Glasgow and the, and the Health Board has been repaired because they are working, because I, I heard evidence from both um, Robert Calderwood and George Black, you know, at the same desk, you know, and they were working together extremely well. But there was a really bad relationship there in the past, which has obviously been mended, but that's because the leadership insisted that it happen and that that partnership is going to be driven forward. So, I mean, I think it is important. I think the, the relationship is important and makes it easier. But is it necessary? No, you can drive it forward if the leadership's right. Finally, Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, panel. Uh, in the previous panel, I posed a question regarding the uh, uh, benchmarking, and Sarah Davidson earlier in, in her comments uh, spoke about uh, this, uh, the introduction of the benchmarking in spring. Can you provide some information, please, as to what's going to happen? At the moment, um, the Improvement Service and Solace and the Scottish Government are working with partnerships in order to identify uh, what you might think of as kind of family groups of CPPs, so ones who have sufficient um, identity in common that it would make sense to, to benchmark against them, and will identify an agreement with them what would be the sensible outcomes to be measuring, um, and then that will be introduced and, and, and tried out effectively in CPPs starting from this spring, and we'll learn from that whether they've got the, the indicators and the benchmarks right or not. Um, I'm afraid I don't know much more about the detail of that process, and I'm very happy to provide that to the committee in writing afterwards, if that would be helpful. Okay, that certainly would. Uh, <coughs> Uh, but, so, uh, in terms of uh, the benchmarking, is this going to be an additional part to the current benchmarking tool that COSLA uh, have introduced, or is it going to be a separate? Uh, this, this is specific benchmarking for community planning partnerships, right. um, in addition, uh, but, but very much informed by what we've learnt by the work that's been done to benchmark between local authorities. Okay, well, thank you. Certainly, if you can provide information, that would be very helpful. Uh, I think the government health woman on benchmark, it's a tool. Indeed. And it's no more than that. No, exactly. It's, uh, I mean, we've been aware of discussions in our previous committee uh, on that particular uh, tool, but, uh, but no, I mean, you're right, it is a tool. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the actual the, the scope of the community planning partnerships, um, do you think that uh, the membership of the CPPs uh, is adequate? Do you think there should be more uh, people around the table uh, uh, within the 32 areas, or do you think there's possibly too many? The uh, Community Empowerment Bill is, is, is addressing that, prompted by exactly that question and by the differing experience of those who, as we've heard earlier, have either been required to show up or have chosen to show up. And we've very deliberately included within that uh, bodies such as Skill Development Scotland, who clearly have an important role to play and need to be feeding into local planning. Um, there are some bodies, such as the National Parks, who have a, an important role within their immediate locality and clearly not uh, more widely. And we've learned a lot from the experience that we heard about earlier in relation to Scottish Enterprises' allocation of individual members of staff to support uh, community planning bodies. So the bodies which are set out in Schedule 1 of the Community, plan of the, uh, community Empowerment Bill, um, we believe adequately reflect what is currently required um, by community planning partnerships subject to local discussion about roles and responsibilities. But I'm sure that the government and the parliament, if, if required, would be uh, very open to amending that in future if it was felt that there was a gap. And I suppose it's also important to recognise that in addition to those formal statutory public authorities, there is a very important and growing role for the third sector who are critical providers of services and whose insight into the experience of service users uh, in local areas is very, very important. And you know, we know that there are some community planning partnerships who've done very good work already at bringing that voice to the table and others who've got further to go. So I think it's important that we, when we're talking about partners, we're not just thinking about the statutory ones, but also thinking about community groups and uh, bodies which deliver services who are not public agencies. 
Okay, thank you. Um, a few moments ago, uh, Pat Waters uh, gave the, an example of the, of the working arrangements between the NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and the City of Glasgow. Uh, and I posed a question to the previous panel just regarding the, uh, the chairs of the CPPs. Um, I'm just keen to uh, kind of, uh, get the impression from the panellists in terms of do you think that, uh, that having independent chairs would actually be beneficial for CPPs? Well, I think, given the experience of an independent chair in the national group, probably the answer is no. <laughs> okay. Well, no. I, I, I would, in all seriousness, in all seriousness. I mean, I do think it's it's, uh, it's people with buy-in that should be chairing it. So I think it should be members of the actual local CPP who is actually the chair. It. I don't think bringing an independent chair would actually add any value. Um, if you've got the, you know, people who have who have got a stake in that area and a stake in the organisation, I think that's far, far better and more motivation to ensure that what they're going to do is drive the thing forward. So my answer would be no, I don't think it would add any value and so therefore I would, I would probably support having the, the local group electing the chair locally. Okay, thank you. And one final question is okay. Uh, it's uh, in paragraph 25 of the report, uh, but this was discussed earlier on too, it was regarding the, that the partners need to create a more uh, effective leadership uh, challenge and control in CPP <laughs> boards. It goes on to say that uh, support is required for CPPs to develop the skills and culture that are needed to create effective challenge within CPP boards. What support do you think uh, is actually required and how can that support be delivered? I think it's important that to an extent we're led by CPPs telling us what they think they need, but it was interesting to hear the two CPPs who were represented earlier having quite good insight into the uh, nature of partnership working and the things which they need to be able to do. And I know that the Improvement Service has offered, in the same way that it does to individual councils, it has ordered, offered help uh, to CPP boards to think about the skills and the uh, culture and approaches that they need to bring. And my guess is that that's where the investment probably is best spent in helping think people to, who, as we've heard for earlier, come from often quite different backgrounds, quite different operational day-to-day -day pressures, and yet have to come together in this space to be effective partners. So if, if I were you know, choosing where to, to put my investment, that's where I would put it. I, mean, I think it is important that um, the opportunity is there. I mean, if there's um, training that's necessary and needed, um, that would make that available. Can we insist that people actually take it? Probably not. Um, but it should not uh, stop us from ensuring that if people need it, we make it available to them. Okay. okay. Another uh, to it, uh, if people are going to be trained, one thing that they need to be trained in is not to mind when somebody stands on their toes. Uh, when I sat in the CCP uh, board, I was quite happy to step on the toes of the health board, but equally I had to be happy to let them step on my toes. When you're sharing priorities, when you're sharing projects, you need to allow that to happen. And on that final note, we can conclude. Uh, can I thank the, the panel for their time this morning? Uh, and can I move the committee into private session? Thank you.